Okay, the board will reconvene to open session at 7.01. Ms. Avala, can you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Ready? We got it. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Item six, roll call. Roll call will reflect that all board members and cabinet are present. Moving on to item 6.1, Amistad High School Student Board Member Oath of Office, administered by Superintendent Bailey. Thank you, President Conover. It's my pleasure to swear in yet another board member today, our student board member for this month, Nadia Zavala. And uh, Nadia is a senior over at Amistad High School. She has attended James Madison Elementary School, Indio Middle School, Indio High, Horizon, Amistad High, in the Desert Sands Unified School District. Highlights of her educational experience in Desert Sands include being an ASB leader at Amistad, and she had a good time in the pre-med program at Indio Middle School, and she reflects on a specific teacher, a sophomore teacher from Horizon, as being pretty awesome. Do you want to give a shout out to that teacher? Okay, thank you. Uh, her hobbies include painting, baking cakes, and cooking for herself. <laughs> leadership experience in the school and the community includes ASB leadership, school site, council president, secretary for Skills USA. She is a volunteer in the community for homeless shelters. An unusual fact about herself, she enjoys watching movies and playing video games. Nadia, if you'd like to join me down front, I'll try not to embarrass you. I'm gonna swear you in officially. Okay, thank you. All right, we're moving on to item number seven, approval of minutes. 7.1, minutes to the regular meeting of February 1st, 2022. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the regular meeting of February 1st, 2022? 
Is there a second? Second by Trisha Pierce. It has been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of the regular meeting of February 1st, 2022. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 All, those op all those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? One. Okay, Over. motion Thank carries. You. Four, zero, one. All right, item eight. Board meeting agenda, Superintendent Bailey, is there any agenda to this evening's agenda? No change. Thank you. Item nine, Ad agenda of the regular meeting of February 15, 2022. So approval. Is there a motion to approve the agenda of the regular meeting of February 15, 2022? So moved, Wendy Jonathan. Is there a second? It has been moved and seconded to approve the agenda of the regular meeting of February 15, 2022. Is there any discussion? Yes, there needs to be a correction. Um, the student board member um, on the agenda has a different name than Nadia's, and we need Nadia's name on our agenda. Okay. Any further discussion? Any other comments? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? Motions carries 5-0 with one provisional vote. Moving on to item 10, community staff student recognition, Superintendent Bailey. Favorite items, I'll ask Mary Perry, our PIO, to come to the podium and recognize community staff and student this evening. Thank you very much. As always, it's my great pleasure to recognize folks from the district who have done something extraordinary or have been recognized for some wonderful thing that they've done. So I have two tonight. So I want to start with a little inside information for you. So One Future Coachella Valley has released the names of those being honored at their March 30th award celebration. And our own Kevin Bebo, Kev, come on, Director of College and Career Readiness, will be receiving the Inspiring Leaders Award. And in announcing the, the award, they said, your contribution to our community has been exemplary to help advance the regional plan for college and career success and our mission. And it's my great pleasure to work with Kevin on a number of projects as we consider ourselves members of the communications team. And I have to tell you, he truly deserves this award. So please congratulate Kevin. You can come say something if you'd like. I want you to know it's very unusual for Kevin to be speechless, but <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. It's a red letter day. Um, in December, I told you about several DSUSD schools that were recognized as common sense schools. And last week, we received word that another one of our schools has been recognized. And you may remember it's based on four steps, learn, the teaching of digital citizenship, engaging families, and reflection on, reflection on the concepts of digital citizenship and applying those concepts. And I don't see Dr. Jessica Mendoza here, um, but please join me in congratulating Desert Ridge Academy. And that's it for tonight, but I'll tell you, I already have some ready for the next time. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Any comments on these recognitions? Ms. Savadla, do you have any comments? Okay. Mr. Alvarez? No? Okay. Ms. Pierce? Ms. Porras? Ms. Jonathan? I just want to say, uh, Kevin, kudos to you. I remember when you were over at Palm Desert High School handing the CTE program, now you're overseeing it, the district. Excellent job. You've really taken us to a different level. So thank you so much. 
and congratulations to Desert Ridge Academy for being uh, an additional school that has, uh, has been awarded the Common Sense uh, School Award. So congratulations to both. Yes, uh, congratulations to DRA. And I just want to give a shout out to Kevin, uh, at the board's vision to expand CTE offerings. It was pretty amazing to visit uh, Eisenhower recently and see the tiny house in its current condition. I understand it's moving on to Modernism Week as a feature when it's finished. Uh, that's the, uh, the hope, correct? Um, anyway, I congratulate you very much on that project. Yes, congratulations. We were able to see the actual tiny house. It is not totally complete, but it is on its way. And congratulations to DRA. And we're moving on to item 11, introduction of new or recently promoted employees. We have none. Okay. Item 12, information items, we have none. Item 13, staff conference items. And Superintendent Bailey, supplement to the annual update to the 2021-2022 local control and accountability plan presentation. No requirement for the LCAP. I'll defer to Dr. Kelly May Vollmer to lead the presentation. Uh, thank you very much. And I actually am going to have Kristen Wood, our LCAP coordinator, come up and she'll be walking you through this mid-year update. Good evening. I'm here to present the mid-year LCAP update. The first few slides will reference the report labeled supplement to the annual update. And then we'll move on to the other report labeled 2122 local control and accountability plan actions and services mid-year report. Section 124E of Assembly Bill 130 requires LEAs to present a mid-year review on the annual update to the 21-22 LCAP and budget overview for parents on or before February 28th, 22, at a regularly scheduled meeting of the governing board. At this meeting, the LEA must include all of the following. The supplement for the annual update for the 21-22 LCAP LCAP, all available mid-year outcome data related to the metrics identified in the 21-22 LCAP and mid-year expenditure and implementation data on all actions identified in the 21-22 LCAP. Over the last two years, we have written seven new plans that have been created in support of students, families, and schools due to the recent pandemic. With all of the plans, we continue to use the lens of our three LCAP goals that support our vision of successfully preparing every student for college, career, and life. The LCAP supplement contains five prompts. One, describe how and when the district engaged or plans to engage its educational partners on the use of the funds. Number two, describe how the district used or plans to use the additional concentration grant add-on funding to provide direct services for the low-income English learners and or foster youth population. Three, describe how and when the district engaged its educational partners on the use of the one-time federal funds that are intended to support recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Four, Describe how the district is implementing the ESSER three funds and explain the successes and challenges during that implementation. And number five, describe how the district is using its fiscal resources for the 21-22 year in a manner that is consistent with the other plans and how they are aligned to the LCAP. Prompt one is located on page one, that very first page of the supplement to the annual update. DSUSD receives input on a variety of district programs and services, including the listed Budgeted Act funds. Not only are these funds presented or will be presented at public meetings with the opportunity for public comment, but various collaboration meetings are held or will be held, and it, the educational partner feedback is routinely collected through our Thought Exchange platform. Prompt two is located on page three of the supplement document, and all DSUSD schools have an enrollment of unduplicated student groups greater than 55%. The use of concentration funds 
uh, the grant add-on funding is to increase the number of staff who will provide direct services to students such as custodians, psychologists, ELD teachers, and tutoring and intervention programs. Prompt three on pages three through six, we've identified the variety of engagement opportunities we had with our educational partners regarding federal funding. We utilize multimedia projects such as Peach Jar, social media posts, and school and district websites. We also used a variety of feedback platforms such as Google Forms, collaborative slide decks, and Thought Exchange. Examples of community meetings include the virtual Bailey and Coffee uh, launch that launched the community and staff survey regarding the 2021 school opening plan. And some examples of our advisory meetings includes our LCAP advisory meeting, our state and federal joint parent meetings, special education pa parent meetings, and also working with our student leaders at our secondary school sites. Prop four is on the bottom of page six and continues to page nine. It includes information about the successes and challenges experienced with the implementation of the ESSER three plan. Some examples of successes are the hiring and training of 24 new custodians, new bus software to assist with COVID mitigation and communication, the use of Zoom as an effective tool to virtually engage with teachers, parents, community members, and district personnel, the implementation of independent study and meal kits delivered to the Horizon Independent Study Virtual School. Some challenges, of course, we have encountered have been with attendance, food and supplies, and staffing issues associated with COVID. Prompt five is on page nine and continues to page 12. This section highlights how the additional fiscal resources are aligned and consistent with the LCAP, such as the connections of the learning continuity and attendance plan with ESSER three, the alignment of the learning continuity and attendance plan with the expanded learning opportunities grant and ESSER three, the connections of the LCAP with ESSER three and how in-person instruction and expanded learning opportunity priorities can continue with the support of ESSER 3. At this point in the school year, some metric outcomes are unknown, some are in progress, and some outcomes, outcomes are known. The metrics for each of the LCAP goal will be shared on the following slides. And now you can move to your second document that's labeled the mid-year, the 21-22 Local Control and Accountability Plan Actions and Services Mid-Year Report. Similar to the metrics, some LCAP actions have not been started, some are in progress, and some are completed. An update of the LCAP actions will be shared with the expenditures through the mid-year budget update on the slides following the metric slides with each of the goals. Goal one, all students will demonstrate growth as measured by federal, state, and district assessments. The metrics for goal one begin on page one of the actions and services mid-year report. As we mentioned earlier with the bucket slide, we have some metrics with outcomes in progress, such as our quarterly reporting of teachers that are appropriately assigned and fully credentialed, as noted in 1A. And metrics with unknown outcomes, such as 1C and 1D, are ELA and math academic indicators on the California School Dashboard that were suspended for the 21 year due to COVID. Metric 1F would be an example of a metric that has been adjusted due to new state reporting certification deadlines. However, note that we have made growth with our EL reclassification rate. In 2019-20, our rate was 5.1% and the rate for 2021 increased to 8.6. Metrics 1G, through 1i are examples of metrics in progress since the data available to report out will not be available 
until spring and will therefore be in the annual review of the LCAP. Actions and services for goal one begin on page three of the report. There are nine actions and services listed in the LCAP with about five to seven subcategories per action area. And again, as we mentioned earlier with the bucket slides, uh, we have some actions as providing professional development for full day kindergarten teachers listed in 1.5 interventions and summer school and math support for our high schools. Some actions that are in progress are before and after school tutoring, science consumables for our TK through fifth grade students, and our parent engagement partnership with PK. PK is Parent Institute for Quality Education. It's a national organization that empowers and supports our English learner parents to actively engage in their child's education and strengthen parent school collaboration. These academies or trainings are ongoing throughout the year. Goal two, all students will graduate and be prepared to make a successful transition to further education and our career opportunities. The metrics for goal two begin on page 12 of the report. 2A is an example of a metric where progress is known due to how that metric is reported. Since it is a graduation rate and where graduation falls within a school year, the previous year, as in this case 2021, is reported in the LCAP document. And 2F is an example of unknown due to the time in which the results are reported and therefore will be reported in spring with the annual uh, review of the LCAP. 2J is another example of results being reported in spring, and 2K is another example of a known outcome because this data is based on enrollment and that information can be pulled earlier in the year with our own student information system. Actions for goal two begin on page 16 of the report. There are four actions and services that are listed with the LCAP and again, about five to nine subcategories per action. There are some actions that have been mostly completed with 2.1 course access advanced programs, such as providing PSAT and SAT assignments for our secondary students. And with 2.3, career technical education with supporting CTE assistant principals and office technicians at our high schools. And in progress action would be the, the cost of AP exams in 2.1 and the promotion of career technical education programs and various other ongoing supports such as licensing with food handling and culinary, first aid and CPR certification in the medical and academy uh, health academies and supporting the military science program. Goal three, all students will develop and consistently demonstrate responsible, respectful, and ethical behavior in safe, clean, and orderly learning environment. The metrics for goal three begin on page 22 of the report, with metric 3B being another example of results that will be reported in the spring. Both 3F and 3G are related to our panorama surveys that provide information on the culture and climate of our school campuses. Currently, our family panorama survey, it will be open until February 25th. And our teacher, staff, and student panorama survey will be open from March 1st through the 25th. Both of these metrics will also be included in the annual review of the LCAP. Actions and services for goal three begin on page 24 of the report. There are nine actions and services listed in the LCAP with also about five to nine subcategories per action area. The actions listed in 3.1 includes community technicians that provide tier three support to students and families experiencing ongoing absenteeism, the health and attendance clerks at our elementary sites, and technological solu solutions to track student level attendance and intervention information. 
The funding designated at 3.2 site-based positive behavior support programs was allocated for tier two training, which were delayed due to staffing issues associated with COVID, but will resume in the spring. We are currently offering after school academies with tier one support and have completed three of the six planned trainings. The funding for 3.9 supports the needs of foster and homeless youth is typically spent on items such as uniforms, backpacks, school supplies, hygiene kits, bus tickets, and other related supplies for school. We have a surplus that is being used this year. In addition, we have received increased homeless education funding from RCOE this school year and prioritize spending down the county funding before tapping into our supplemental concentration funding. Currently, orders are being placed to purchase additional needed items for foster and homeless youth, so we will anticipate that this funding will be spent down by the end of the year. When the board adopted our DSUSD LCAP and budget on July 20th, 2021, the state budget act was not complete. The adopted state budget included additional funds that were not anticipated by our district. The impact to our adopted budget overview for parents is provided in this table and will be discussed by Mr. Aquino. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> So uh, everything Mrs. Wood talked about is encapsulated into this budget here. This is a very, uh, very, very general overview of our district's budget, also uh, referred to as our general operating budget. You can see here is a quick summary of uh, pretty much uh, the general fund expenditures and district revenues, which are separated into four different categories. The local control funding formula, which makes up a majority of our uh, funds from the state, that's driven by student attendance and uh, our unduplicated pupil count all other state funds, local funds, and federal funds. Now, as she mentioned, prior to the start of each fiscal year, the district creates a budget based on its planned expenditures, things like salaries, utilities, and revenue assumptions, which are based on the governor's projection that are done in May, uh, which is a revision to his state budget. And we also do projections based on student enrollment, what we think that's gonna be for the next year. Um, this budget overview for parents shows you the changes that are made from our adopted budget, our original budget that was approved by the board in June, uh, to pretty much our first interim, the changes that have been made uh, up to that point. Uh, as uh, Mrs. Wood was mentioning, the state uh, enacted uh, significant augmentations to their K-12 budget. A lot of that was due to the fact that the state received uh, a lot more money than they were anticipating due to the economy. Uh, that is all reflected in our adjustment to the budget, uh, where you can see on that middle column where it says actual 2021 budgeted amount. Uh, some of those changes, and I'll just highlight a couple of them. Um, LCFF received its first augmentation uh, since 2013, 2014. Uh, we get funded additional state funds based on uh, the percentage that we have under our unduplicated pupil count. So every student that is above uh, I believe it's 55%, the state gives us an additional 50% of our LCFF per student dollar amount. That now is grown to 65%. So that's where you see the $6.1 million increase there on the LCFF supplemental concentration grant line. Uh, the state also due to augmented revenues, um, expanded learning programs for students in addition to targeted professional uh, learning programs, also referred to the, as the Educator Effectiveness Block Grants. That was about $10 million. Those are um, targeted programs. Uh, in addition, um, every year when we adopt a budget, we're also closing the books. And we don't know what that carryover from prior year programs is until we complete that, which happens in September. So once we know what those dollar amounts are, we budget that into the budget, which typically occurs during the first interim, uh, which the board approved this past December. Um, so we put all that carry over back into the budget. Um, so you could see those numbers reflected in um, the federal funds of that 38.5 million and the 18. Now there's been a lot of question as to, you know, the district received all these COVID relief dollars one time. Um, you know, what, what did the district do with that? And a lot of the things that Mrs. Wood talked about are 
uh, are tied to personnel, things that have an ongoing uh, nature as far as their expenditure is concerned. So that carryover is used to fund a lot of those planned positions that we have. Again, those are categorical uh, slash targeted programs. Um, so that's pretty much um, a majority. Uh, the major increase you could see from the uh, original time when we adopted the budget is the LCFF supplemental concentration, and that was the augmentation to the LCFF program. And a lot of the other increases are carryover. Thank you, Mr. Aquino. The continuing impacts of COVID-19 pandemic, including the challenges of hiring staff, implementing health and safety protocols, and addressing learning acceleration needs due to the impacts of distance learning has presented many challenges for the first half of the school year. Despite these challenges, Desert Sands Unified School District is committed to implementing the LCAP to provide the necessary services to our students. We acknowledge and sincerely thank the hard work and dedication of our employees, the support of our parents, and the resilience of our students to continue our reach for excellence. Thank you, and this is the end of the mid-year report. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Alvarez, do you have any questions? I do not have any questions. Thank you. Here's. Thank you for this report. I see I have a lot of reading to do so I can be <laughs> up to date on, on all the points. Thank you. You're welcome. Horace? As usual, an awesome report. Thank you so much, Kristen. Thank you. But I have no questions. Thank you. Jonathan? Thank you. Um, I, you know, I'm, I like seeing that we're doing, uh, spending even more, making sure that we're expanding our AVID program in the LCAP. Um, and I like seeing that. I also like seeing that, uh, uh, that we're, as, as you said, we're continuing to advance our, our work with our parents and making sure our parents are engaged and the educational early childhood educational programs. I do want to say some concern because I see that, you know, we're addressing uh, graduation rate and obviously we don't have a basis. Um, things have been kind of cr crazy this past year and, and the previous year, but I do want to note that uh, my understanding is that there's been a drop in graduation rates in with regards to men versus girl, boys versus uh, girls. And I do think that we might want to make sure that uh, when we get our results back at the end of this year, that we may have to pivot and adjust to make sure we're addressing those concerns. Because I don't think we have anything uh, that we've talked about for helping our boys in, uh, as far as their graduation rate. Thank, thank you for bringing that up. We certainly can provide you an updated report specifically on the difference between the two groups that you addressed. We, we did, however, um, if you refer back to the report though, our graduation rate actually went from a 91% to a 94%. So certainly that's with some of the COVID related adjustments, but a growth there in the graduation rate, but we will get you that specific data. Right, and you know, the uh, Cal State San Bernardino Palm Desert campus came out and said that they've had less boys going off to college. Boys have been struggling in our schools and we need to address that, that group that's not, that's kind of falling through the cracks, so. There you go. Thank you for the presentation. I have no questions. Thank you. Okay. And that was item 13.1. We're moving on to 13.2, Measure KK update. Superintendent Bailey. Absolutely. Um, I'm actually excited about this presentation. As you know, uh, Measure KK came into functionality back in 2014. And since that time, we've been working to expend those funds to make our facilities as good as they can be uh, through remodern or excuse me, through modernization and new construction. And tonight you get to hear an update where we are with the uh, Measure KK bond monies and those capital projects. Mr. Kino, do you have any comments? Okay, Mr. Cisneros. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, uh, board members and cabinet. Uh, it's a privilege to give a brief update on Measure KK uh, so we're just going to start uh, with three, cover three areas today, the Measure KK program overview and the timeline of the bond program. We're going to talk a little bit about Measure KK projects and the state funding availability, and then look at phase two and phase three of Measure KK and where we are today. 
So just a brief overview, as um, Superintendent Bailey mentioned, $225 billion was the bond that was passed in November 2014 by the voters within the district. Out of that, that was broken down into three different phases. So we have 75 million, which included three large projects from 2015 to 2018. Then we went on to the second phase, which is $100 million, uh, which included six major uh, projects. And then we went on to the last phase, which is uh, phase uh, three, which is 50 million. And that was uh, scheduled to be 2022 and on. And that includes three major uh, modernization projects. Um, and just as you put that into a timeline, you can see the first $75 million there in 2015. Then we did, we sold the next 100 million in 2019, which covered the, the six major projects. And then we went on to our last phase, which was the last 50 million, which was supposed to be in 2022, but we did take advantage of the market conditions and the interest rates working with our financial advisors and Mr. Aquino, at Mr. Aquino's direction as well, and guidance and oversight. And we actually accelerated that sale and, and moved it up into 2020. So um, we, we did good for the uh, local constituents of the district and uh, including in that. So if you just take a quick overview of that, you had the 75 million in 2015, you have the 100 million in 2019, and then the last 50 million uh, in 20, was sold in 2020. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the Measure KK projects and state funding. So just a brief uh, overview of the $75 million phase one, we have the three, three major projects in that uh, uh, phase. And out of those uh, projects, we had Hoover and La Quinta, which were eligible for state matching funds. Now that state program is a 60-40 program district matches 40% of their eligibility. In order to be eligible, you gotta have a, your facility has to be 25 years or older and has not received state funding within that time frame. It's also based on enrollment at that site. So we submitted those applications for Hoover and La Quinta and we did get the funds uh, for that, for those two projects already. You'll see there's another box beyond bond authority, which I'll share with you in just a little bit on the next slide. So moving on to the 100 million, which was phase two out of those sites, we had all of those were eligible. We submitted all those projects. Madison is actually right now in the process, any hour, day, tomorrow, today <laughs> of getting submitted. So I just wanna make that clarification. And you don't, you see there that we don't have funds received because they are on the beyond bond authority uh, list with the state. So in 2012, um, the state uh, office of public school construction they implemented a process for how to receive uh, funding applications uh, when they're out of bonding authority when they have no more funds available and that process is established where the district submit on a first come first serve basis opsc which is the office of public school construction reviews our applications verifies that they're complete once they're complete they go ahead and get them approved through their board to be on the acknowledged beyond bond authority list so we're in line and ready to get funding as soon as the state has funding available. So those projects in phase two are submitted and ready to go with the exception, as I mentioned, Madison. Next was the 50 million out of those projects, we have Carter and Truman. And those are, we just recently, those are obviously not there. Truman is out to bid right now. Carter is going out to bid in the next week. So we do have recently a California Department of Education approval in getting that, now we also have DSA approval and now we're ready to submit, getting ready to submit our funding applications to get ourselves in line as well. Those projects will also go on the Beyond Bond Authority um, list as well. So Patrick, that's- Patrick, if I just may add, um, just for the board's knowledge, but what we do as far as our projects are by design. Um, and when Patrick mentions the Beyond Bond Authority, uh, we are trying to maximize the taxpayer dollars by a by applying projects uh, to any bonds that were passed locally where the state would then turn around and match us. So we never budget our projects based on the state match that we anticipate, but when that do come, when that, when those funds do come in, then we can address needs that will ultimately be addressed in our facilities master plan later this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Aquino. So altogether, uh, the, the district here has about $24.5 million in state funding applications um, 
with the state right now. So that's a very good thing. We got in line, we're getting ourselves, all of our paperwork is in order so that we can maximize and capture as much of the state funding that becomes available. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about Measure KK Phase Two and Phase Three progress and just give you a quick update of where we are. So we're currently in the last phase of Madison Elementary School. That campus was new kindergarten buildings and a full campus-wide modernization. Uh, currently, you can see there on uh, slide 13, you can see just an overall campus modernization perspective of how that campus is gonna kind of turn out and be refaced overall at Madison Elementary School. You can see the two new kindergarten buildings there in the same location of where the uh, previous ones were, footprint in a sense, and you just see that all completely refaced and repurposed uh, at that campus, looking really nice now. There's, there you can see uh, the kindergarten classrooms, the library and administration, and you can see all those all just now starting to come together. And we will be occupying and turning over the kindergarten buildings here in the spring break of this year. And uh, that will be kind of the last last uh, phase of our construction at Madison Elementary School. So we're excited about that to, get, to turn that site over to the campus again. So moving on to Lincoln Elementary School. Lincoln Elementary School, there you can see we have, is similar to Kennedy, which we just uh, completed last year. Uh, you see the brown area is, used to be the play fields, which we now have repurposed where we're putting the new buildings and creating a new campus. The yellow buildings are going to be demolished and then we're going to keep three of the existing buildings on campus and um, create a whole new campus at, that, at, at Lincoln Elementary School. And there's some perspectives that you can see down at the bottom of the page is Magnesia Falls and over to the far right, uh, which you can't really see, but on the edge of those buildings and those houses is Portola Avenue. So um, looking at the three black arrows, that is where the existing buildings are going to continue to remain. And you see all the rest of the buildings are new at this campus. There's just some more perspectives. You can look back, you can look over looking to the uh, Northwest. You can see Magnesia Falls on the top right and Portola on the left. So you can see those new buildings all coming into place there. And that's how the campus is gonna finally shape up when we're pretty much wrapped up there. Here's just another perspective looking at Magnesia Falls and then off of Portola on the right-hand side. So you can see the darker gray building is the administration. You have classroom wings going along Portola. And then across, uh, you have some of the existing classroom wings, the NPR in the middle, and then the existing library campus over there. Here's just some interior perspectives. If you're inside the campus, this is what you're gonna start to see as the campus now is shaping up. So you can see the kindergarten wing off to the left side and then a the primary classroom uh, to the right side in the yellow. And then here you have just how it really is starting to come together. You can see there the uh, primary class, the kinder uh, wing there, and also some of the, uh, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth grade level uh, classroom buildings there. So we're expected, we start in February, 2021. We're expected to complete that entire project in the end of August, 2022. So we will be turning over the new campus, all the new buildings here um, in spring break. So that's our goal right now. So we're looking good, we're looking good and we're excited about the, the progress that's happening over there at Lincoln Elementary School. So then we also have Ford Elementary School, which was a campus-wide modernization. We added new classroom buildings to replace the portables, which are in the yellow there on the asphalt area. And then we added a new so additional kinder classrooms, two cl kinder classrooms at this campus there. Uh -uh. So right now, um, the new classroom building is complete. That was occupied at the start of this school year. So we're excited and they're really, really uh, liking that facility there. And they're just really coming together. And you can see here how they are utilizing some of the common areas and then some of the uh there's some of the existing uh, classroom buildings that were already modernized off to the right so this project started in 2020 and we're going to be wrapping this up here this august of this year as well truman elementary school is uh, part of phase three the last 50 million and you can see this is a campus-wide modernization as well and we have uh, this starting in june of 2022 this one is currently out to bid right now and we're looking at wrapping this up in August of 2023. And as you can see, this campus is going to, we're going to take the two administration uh, buildings, which used to be for two campuses when it was originally built. And we're going to bring everything over to the center of the campus. And we're going to repurpose the uh, administration building that is on the west of the campus and, and uh, transition that into a makerspace. 
uh, to help support that STEM program over at that campus. So we're excited about that. And those arrows are kind of directing you how everybody's gonna kind of get into the single point of entry in the center administration building. This just gives you a perspective of that campus. This is where the maker space will be. This is the west side of the campus. Everybody will walk um, to the east and enter into the main campus as those arrows indicated on the previous slide. Here's some perspectives just to give you how the color is gonna be, uh, the colors at this campus, how they're lining up with their um, mascot and we're refacing this campus as well and putting some new finishes on it. It's gonna really turn out really nice here. So here's some more perspectives of the buildings. And there's the NPR. So moving on to Carter Elementary School, this is the last of the phase uh, three. We have a campus-wide modernization. We're also putting a classroom building here to replace the portables that are out there on the uh, east side of the campus. And then we're also putting, um, we're re repurposing some of the classroom space to create an admin space on the uh, west side of the campus so that we have a better flow of traffic out there. And that's where that blue arrow is now. So if you take a look at this uh, aerial view or overview, you can see the admin now off by the uh, west parking lot and you see the flow of traffic coming in. They'll enter in where that arrow is indicating next to the square in the admin. And you can see off to the right of the page, you see the new classroom building. So there's some perspectives of the uh, new classroom building. Oh, that's gonna be over on the east side of the campus to replace the portable classrooms. And there's some also some renderings and perspectives of the common spaces inside the uh, new classroom building and also the common spaces throughout the corridors of the um, existing classroom building where it's breaking up in colors and also by grade levels. So we're excited about what's taking place over there as well. And that's really the update on uh, Measure KK. And I wanna thank you for the opportunity at this time. Any questions or? Davros, do you have any questions? I don't, um, I don't have any questions, but I've seen the work just going through and driving through the properties, um, specifically like uh, Truman and, and um, Lincoln. And uh, so you guys have been doing a good job keeping the traffic going, which I think sometimes could get caught up in morning uh, pickups and then late afternoon drop off. So good job in mitigating some of those issues because um, for the most part, pickup and drop offs are difficult to get through anyways, but given the additional construction I could see uh, for opportunity for something like that to happen, but great job and everything looks good. Thank you. Great report. I appreciate it. And I'd like to see all the renderings of what it's going to look like. I'm excited to drive by and um, Ford, especially. I love the way they're so open and you can look in the windows and see the great bright classrooms going on. So thank you for that. Boris. Hi, Patrick. Great job. Okay. Um, I just have a question on the, uh, for Truman, the lunch shelter area, or is that covered? Is that covered like for the kids? So uh, Truman Elementary School, yes, there is a covered lunch shelter area. Okay. I'm just, I'm glad that there's, that that's happening because our kids need shade, you know, especially during summer when it's hot. So I'm glad that that's happening. And then as far as like the school colors, when you're deciding on these, uh, different places. I, I just noticed there's a lot of different colors. Do you have the school colors implemented like you did for um, Madison, right? Because I know that's like very patriotic, but. Yes, and we're also getting feedback, uh, not only from with cabinets oversight, but also from the school sites, school site level as well. Okay, great. No, they look beautiful. You guys are doing an awesome job. Thank you. Jonathan? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Patrick, and thank you also because we've had a talk and I know that there's some changes being done to Lincoln. I really appreciate you doing that. Um, it's exciting because I was on the board. I started in 2012, I believe, and so I was there when we created this facilities plan and watching it come to fruition is really exciting because so many of our schools were really, um, uh, really kind of falling apart. <laughs> and it's so nice to see how fresh and new they look and, and also having different uh, architects work on the schools. So each one kind of has its own personality and they aren't these rubber cut uh, 
you know, cutting little st rubber stamp kind of schools where they're all looking the same cookie cutter schools. Mm -hmm. That's what I was looking for. So um, that's exciting. Um, I do want to, you know, uh, I know that um, Ms. Porras mentioned about the, um, the shade structure. I know over at Ford, they still have that shade structure, which is really not a shade structure for the, and I'm assuming that uh, we'll be talking about that when we talk about future bond and facilities, because there are still things that need to be done. And unfortunately, it's like your house where you do this, fix this, and then a couple of months later, a year later, or two years later, now you have to fix this, and now you have to fix that. And uh, so it's always updating everything, but I appreciate all your work. You've done a great job. Thank you. Bailey? Patrick, I just want to thank you. I realize uh, this, this work is mind boggling. And certainly when we did go and refinance and leverage the current bonds, we knew that was going to accelerate your work just that much more. I just think you've done a fabulous job. Thank you. Thank you very much. I got to give a shout out to my facilities team who does an awesome job as well. <laughs> so thanks to them. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And next item, 13.3 facilities, master plan update, Superintendent Bailey. Certainly this uh, seems to be a theme for the tonight. Uh, certainly the funding plays very much into the needs. So we're in the process of right now of determining what the needs are in the next five years. And then we'll be talking about uh, funding sources for those projects. So uh, Patrick's going to continue his presentation in uh, giving us a status report on identification of facilities needs. All right, once again, uh, I'm here before you and we're gonna go ahead and give you an update on the long range facilities master plan uh, today. But I do want to uh, let you all know um, that I have two uh, representatives from the architectural team that is uh, developing the master plan with us. We have Mr. Roger Clark and also Kristen Rose from Runau, Runau, from Runau Clark Architects. Um, with us today. Uh, they both have a depth of knowledge within the district. Obviously, Roger Clark has been, and Runa has been in the district for over 20 plus years, I'm sure. And uh, we, we see his work across the district. So uh, they're a great asset to have on the team and working as part, working on this uh, long range facilities master plan. Um, so this is a, this is a um, update from our May 4th, uh, 2021 study session. And then as a result of that, when we presented a measure KK update and the needs that were still present throughout the district, uh, the board authorized in August the contract with Runa Clark Architects uh, to go ahead and implement the, and update the Long Range Facilities Master Plan. So today we're going to be talking, covering about 10 uh, various elements of the uh, Facilities Master Plan update. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the overview of a master plan, talk about the task and the timeline, some stakeholder input and what what um, was involved when we gathered stakeholder input. Also the educational specifications overview. We're gonna dig, dig a little bit deeper and give an, an overview of what, that, what the edu educational specifications are and how they affect the district and the facilities at a district. Talk about project updates, deferred maintenance, our, our capacity projections based on enrollment uh, across the district. And then the universal transitional kindergarten uh, program, how that affects uh, Desert Sands and our facilities. And then we'll look at some uh, preliminary school site master plans and, uh, as well. So um, just, just a quick overview of what really is a facilities master plan. So it really is, we can look at it as uh, uh, what to do, when to do it, <laughs> how much it costs. And it's all based about really which projects uh, at which sites. It helps us to create that vision for the district as far as the facilities and as far as the education. It's that roadmap that we use, as uh, Mr. Jonathan mentioned, in 2014 and fully developed out and we put a plan together. So it's that roadmap to the desired facilities that are envisioned for our schools. And it also, it, it, it also includes the cost and finance strategies to identify how we're gonna pay for the facility improvements. And then it's the strategic planning that will help us implement that master plan and get these projects moving forward. Um, as far as the task and timeline, uh, we, we, we have already did all the data collection. Uh, we've done all of the site assessments, interviews with principals. Uh, we've gathered stakeholder input from uh, the community surveys, uh, staff surveys. We also got engagement from the different uh, educational departments and the vision for the district as far as education. 
We've also now, right now, we're in the process of the master plan uh, scope of work at each campus and developing costs for each one of those campuses. So this is taking the district at a whole and every campus within the district. After that, we're going to move on to develop the implementation plan. And really, what is that? What does it look like and how do we implement this and what are the strategies that we're going to go after so that we can put this plan into action and how do we achieve that so that's that's next on the timeline so from here i'm going to turn this over to miss Kristen rose who she's going to take it over and then roger clark will jump in as well good evening thank you um so master planning is really a layered process um, and we collect a lot of input not just in terms of your facilities information, we do wanna understand the context and the history of your facilities. Um, we have an advantage because we have been working with your district for um, a couple of decades now. Um, so that really helps us. But one of the key items first up is stakeholder input. Um, you had great participation in your community survey that we sent out, uh, and that was really informative uh, for our team, over 1,200 participants. Uh, we also spoke one-on-one -on -one which, with each of your principals at every site and got some great feedback at a granular level about what are the specific needs at each of those sites and also how uh, each of the school sites is utilizing the space that they have to implement their programs. Um, and then we met with other key groups, including cabinet, um, ed services team, um, career technical education and special education. And here's what we learned. Um, stakeholders really wanna see uh, innovation spaces, uh, spaces that support STEM education, um, looking at opportunities to repurpose computer labs. So um, computer labs that were previously designed with fixed casework, uh, fixed seating, and now we're looking to maybe look at those spaces. Can we repurpose them to make them more flexible uh, and to support those STEM learning programs? Um, and again, moving on to flexible spaces, looking at collaboration corridors, uh, maker spaces. So um, what we heard is that there's really a move towards project-based and hands-on activities. And if there's a space that can accommodate those kinds of programs, that would be preferred. Um, Up-to-date technology. You guys have already done a really good job of incorporating your large format displays. Uh, and now what we see is a need for, in some spaces, to uh, update those facilities to better accommodate that technology uh, and the ability to move within a space using that technology. We also heard that there's a desire for seamless integration of technology, including indoor and outdoor Wi-Fi. Um, obviously, the last couple of years, we've really seen our dependence on technology. And so the ability for um, learning to happen anywhere uh, is really a priority for your stakeholders. Um, again, we want to continue the focus uh, that's been brought through from the last master plan. We're building on what we established there for safety and security, single points of entry, secure fencing, um, lighting. So some of those sites that maybe didn't get touched or receive that scope of work yet, we're really highlighting it in that plan or in this plan. And then shade. Um, that was a top priority that we heard from nearly all stakeholder groups. Um, is that shade was really important. Um, and what we focused on, uh, or what we heard, was that the student gather gathering areas were key areas for that shade. So lunch areas, amphitheaters, drop-off pickup areas. Um, and so that's where really the focus is uh, in this plan, is uh, providing shade at those student gathering spaces. So moving on to educational specifications. Really, education specifications are the link between facilities and the educational program. Our goal here is just to align the outcomes of your educational program and the way you deliver education with your facilities. Your facility should really support your ability to deliver that education. And that's what we're doing. We're identifying the ways in which your facility will do that. And we spell that out in detail in the plan. And Roger's gonna give a, an overview of potential projects. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, members of the boards. Uh, great to be here again. And it's been 26 years that we've been working here in the district. And so very proud of that and that history. One of the things that a master plan is about though is 
it's not a design. And so I, I don't want, as I show you things and as we talk about things, this is really a plan, but it's not a final design. And so that comes later in the process. Some of the things that we heard about back in 2014 and, and what we've heard again is safety and security is your kids need to be safe when they come to campus. They need to feel secure when they're there. Um, there's issues that we see. These are just some examples, new security fencing at Van Buren. Uh, they have some issues with people coming onto campus and getting onto campus and how can we alleviate that? And so we're identifying uh, a need there. Supervision capabilities at Mitchell Page and probably Desert Ridge has the same issue, but uh, how do we need to deal with that? And, and there's some way that we can actually take that and make it an advantage in terms of a collaboration space. Um, reconfigured circulation, and really it's a bigger issue at, at Andrew Jackson, you know, with uh, pick up a drop off that you mentioned, uh, uh, Jacob, uh, earlier uh, at that site, but there's also kindergarten issues and, and other campus planning issues at Jackson Elementary. Outdoor lighting at Amelia Earhart, and one of the things in terms of that we're going to be looking at with you is outdoor lighting as you get into the late start. What are the impacts from that you know coming up for your practice sessions and those kinds of things and so you may need to think about some of those issues as we go forward but one of the big things and we get excited about is innovative learning environments and some of these on the right are ones that you already have <coughs> excuse me looking to middle school which we were fortunate enough to work on the oliphant elementary school uh, and then the kennedy elementary school and so Continuing that, one of the things we heard loud and clear from your education staff, uh, education services, from your principals, from the parents, from everyone is creating those innovative learning environments. And so taking those computer labs that maybe don't you know, provide that really oomph in terms of the educational outcomes and repurposing those into STEM centers or innovation centers creating maker spaces where we can do 3D printing, we can do project-based learning, we can implement science at younger ages. Um, collaboration spaces, how do we maybe pull kids out into areas where between one classroom and another, they can have that uh, crossover between them and create those collaborative environments where that's not just dedicated, you know, just for teachers, but the students have participation in that. And so you're going to see that in some of the plans that we'll show you tonight. The Wi-Fi connectivity that Kristen talked about is having that universal throughout your campuses wherever you go. And then one of the exciting ones, and we're seeing this more and more, is esports. Uh, and, and this is, you know, an athletic competition or competitive sport. But these kids are actually, in some cases, making money. My own son uh, is in League of Legends, and he's, you know, ranked in the national, you know, uh, rankings for that. And so. This is a big thing and the kids get really excited, really engaged, but there's a lot of learning that goes on in that, whether it's the programming and there's other things that go along with that in terms of the eSports. Career technical education, and these are some of the things that we're already looking at, the greenhouse at Indio High School. Uh, we're implementing that project and that's part of the uh, uh, floral program, but also part of the, the bio uh, program at, at Indio High School that we started a long time ago. The system diagnostics at Amistad High School and enhancing that. The agricultural business at Shadow Hills and providing a facility where they can really launch that program and be even much more successful with it. Uh, we heard about the professional dance, music, and theater program at uh, Palm Desert High School uh, and creating some facilities for that program that are dedicated for those kids out there. And then one of the exciting ones, which you talked about earlier, with this small house or tiny house at uh, the construction program at Eisenhower Community Education Center, and how do we develop that and how do we move that forward? And so we're just in the kind of beginning phases of what does that mean in terms of the master plan? And Kristen. Okay, so what we did is we looked at all of those needs, all of that input, uh, understanding of your educational outcomes, and we identified um, groups or scopes of work. Um, there are some infrastructure items that obviously will need to be taken care of. There are those things that are must-do items, uh, and they tend to be uh, those longer-term deferred maintenance items. This includes your mechanical infrastructure, uh, fire life safety, fire alarms, uh, lighting, um, communications, and then the safety and security items that are also must-do. 
Uh, in addition to that, we're looking at UTK, so Universal Transitional Kindergarten. We're looking at gymnasium pavilion renovations. One of the things that we heard from site principals um, is that the open pavilions are, are sometimes difficult to implement their programs, and so they'd like to explore what does that look like to enclose them. Um, and again, we are exploring that and looking at uh, what are the impacts of those potential projects. Looking at maker spaces and innovation labs, uh, science labs, especially with the new science uh, standards that are coming online. Um, science labs were a definite need for uh, your site, several of your sites. Career technical education, as Roger said, shade structures. Collaboration space, really extending the classroom beyond the four walls, taking over that corridor space or finding ways to uh, make every space a learning space. And then special education integration. Uh, that was a kind of a big thing that we heard is how do we make sure that there are spaces that accommodate a special education and that neurodiversity that you have throughout your sites. So another layer uh, to the master plan is looking at space and capacity. So one of the things that we look at is what is your existing enrollment at existing capacity compared to what your projected enrollment and projected capacity is. Um, now, what one of the things that we did in terms of our methodology in determining the capacity, um, we did take a conservative approach. Uh, we did want to make sure that we were reflecting state loading standards. Uh, and we also looked at your attendance area enrollment projections to make sure that we reflected the way that your sites are currently being used. We also looked at universal transitional kindergarten uh, and your kindergarten program. Um, you are a district that already has a pretty robust TK program, um, but the UTK or the universal transitional kindergarten legislation that requires a full implementation of um, TK programs in 25-26 means that there may be additional need for space uh, to house those students. Um, because this is a new program, and because you don't necessarily have historical, uh, full historical enrollments um, for the full phasing of universal transitional kindergarten, we looked at it in several ways. Uh, we wanted to make sure we understand what do you already have and how are you using that space now? What will your need be when we get to full implementation of universal transitional kindergarten? And then what will your potential need be for your full capacity, or I'm sorry, enrollment projections in 3031? Um, because this is a program that is new and is still being implemented, what we're recommending is that we keep an eye on this, and as you get actual numbers, this information be updated. In terms of the plan, we are making sure that we, you have enough space to accommodate the full implementation uh, of projected enrollment for the Universal TK uh, program in 2025-26. Uh, and again, we want to take somewhat of a conservative approach. You don't want to overbuild, but this is something you'll want to keep track of over time. Thank you, Kristen. I want to go back just for just a second to this page in terms of the enrollment projections, and you'll see some differences here, and I want to point out a couple of these. One is Shadow Hills. And what you're seeing is when that bar on the right-hand side is higher than the bar on the left, that's where you know you have a shortage of classrooms projected. That doesn't mean that it's absolutely going to happen because this is 2031, that's 10 years from now. But it means that we need to watch for that, we need to figure out what it is we need to do and we need to plan for it. And so as you see some of the site plans that I'm gonna show you, you'll see that projected in what we're doing. Same thing I think at Palm Desert High School. Uh, and so some certain sites have that, that deficiency, if you will. A lot of sites have excess capacity. Uh, you're also going to see things like at Reagan, uh, where at that school, because it's such a school of choice, uh, it's going to be start getting overloaded if we don't do something about how we're going, how the district is administering that site. And so there's some of those things that we'll need to keep an eye on and, and work with you on. And so some of the, the categories of things that we started looking at is new site work, landscaping, uh, fixing some of those areas. Uh, new AC paving and concrete paving uh, at sites just to repair things, but also in some cases to fix circulation problems and f fix specific issues, whether it's grading, drainage, 
Uh, amphitheater and outdoor learning areas, addressing those, but addressing those with shade, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, new playground equipment and surfacing. Uh, those things just wear out over time. And then Kristen talked about even, you know, in terms of your deferred maintenances, you know, and suffice to say it's a long time ago now is, you know, Johnson Elementary was, you know, almost 25 years ago. It's coming up on eligibility for state modernization. And so it was one of the newer schools. New construction, and I talked about that, and that's why I went back to the, the scenario of the, the loading in terms of the capacity and, and what you have. New classroom buildings at some sites and looking at that. Uh, we're not looking necessarily that we need new whole new facilities, but there are some new additions at certain places. New shade shelters, and Kristen talked about where those are at and why those are at, but this is not a hard and fixed plan yet in, in any way, shape, or form. That's the design part of that, of working with site administrators and figuring out where is it best to place those. But the ideas are, is you put them where kids are at, uh, and we're gonna show you a couple examples of that. Uh, stadium bleachers, and there's a specific site and a couple different sites that were looked at for that. One is Indio High School, and one is at uh, Palm Desert High School. Major reconfiguration, and, and Kristen talked about this earlier as a part of the, the educational specification, those maker spaces, those innovation centers, and so those require some significant reconfiguration. There's some ADA restroom upgrades that still need to happen. Those codes change over time, unfortunately. And so there's always some kind of, of minor updates that have to happen to that. Converting the standard classrooms in some cases into kindergartens. And so complying with that and making sure that we have adequate facilities uh, for the kindergarten program. And then those pavilions and changing those into gymnasiums was something that we heard loud and clear was a very important part. The modernization, um, exterior and interior finishes, as you, you know, is, you know, carpet wears out. Wall finishes, they need to be repainted. Uh, you have things in the classrooms that, you know, 20 years ago when we first started the standard of teaching walls, that was something that everyone desired. Now it's more of a flexible learning environment where teachers want to move around the classroom. They want to have those technology in different places throughout the classroom. And so that fixed desk and some of those things maybe aren't the best solution anymore. The fire alarm, the electrical, the low voltage, and those are the kind of those upgrades that just over time need to be updated and fixed and addressed in terms of the systems that you have. And so jumping into some of these and what we have is a few examples. Um, and this first one is Amelia Earhart. Uh, and so what you're looking at here is the areas in, in kind of orange or ochre color that you see there are kind of the reconfiguration spaces. That's kind of that, what we call that major modernization. We're taking, we're creating kindergarten spaces, we're creating the maker spaces, those innovation labs. Uh, in this case, we looked at the library and maybe a reconfiguration of that, making it a more flexible space. Uh, there's some restrooms that need to be done. And then also in between those classrooms, we had a, a pullout space. But what we wanted to do or what we talked about doing was again, that idea of those collaboration spaces and creating those areas where you can have kids go out, that they can work in smaller groups, they can work on projects uh, and that teachers can still supervise them. And so how do we create that kind of environment? The other thing you see on here and kind of in that red color um, is the shade. And so in this case, what you're looking at is uh, areas where you have the amphitheater, you have an expanded lunch area, and then on the playground and, and those kinds of areas. And again, it goes back to those, where do kids gather? Where do they need to be? Where do they need to be outside and making sure that they have adequate shade outside. And this may not be enough. And so that's one of the things that, you know, we need feedback from you as the board and, and you as the district in terms of addressing that. One of the other things we looked at at this site, uh, is reconfiguring some of the traffic flow. And it's always been kind of a difficult issue between John Glenn and Amelia Earhart uh, from the first day that it was built uh, and how the circulation works on both of those campuses. And so one of the things we did is, is addressed uh, expanding that parking lot and making that a, a more functional area for Amelia Earhart. The next one, Van Buren, and I talked about this earlier, is fixing that fencing. Um, there's some minor modernization, and I forgot to mention that in the last one, kind of that blue color is, that's those things like fixing the, the carpet and the paint and those kinds of things, is kind of just dressing it up, making it fresh and new. 
Um, and then there's those ochre colors where we're again creating that collaborative collaboration area, whether it's special education or uh, whatever type of space. And you see some of those identified on the plan there, the maker space, uh, the shade areas again in the red. And so those are the major components of what we're seeing at the elementary schools. At Jackson Elementary School, um, one of the things that we've always known about that site, it's a difficult site in terms of circulation, traffic flow. And so one of the ideas, and this actually was in the 2014 master plan of looking at it, is expanding this parking lot on the, on the southern end of the campus. Uh, and possibly that could even go all the way across that field area and provide even more space. We don't really want to overbuild parking and put in asphalt and put money in asphalt if we don't have to. But uh, again, we want to make sure that parents can get to the site safely, they can drop their kids off, uh, and they can move about. But it's about reconfiguring some of those spaces, creating that maker space, addressing special education on this campus. And then again, in this case, we have an addition here where we're creating the new kindergarten spaces on this site. And then you see quite a bit of red on this campus in terms of shade and creating those areas for shade for kids. Mitchell Page. And so I use this one as an example. Uh, in this case, and I'm going to start off with the gymnasium. Uh, kind of in the, the lower part of this. This was one of those open air pavilions. And the idea back then is we were able to save some money. There was a holdover from the old state program where we didn't have to count that square footage quite as high as uh, fully enclosed space. And so we were able to uh, build some additional square footage in the campus because of that. Now it's proven is that we get blow sand, we get other issues that come with having those open and so the idea is how can we capitalize on that and make that an enclosed space? And so by enclosing that, adding some insulation, adding air conditioning, uh, lighting, and that kind of thing, we can actually turn that into a multi-use gymnasium space that actually will work pr pretty dynamically with the adjacent uh, multi-purpose space. Um, creating the maker space, creating that collaboration area, and then addressing those kind of supervision areas that we talked about, which is kind of in the middle of that longest building right there, uh, where there's some kind of unsupervised areas. Uh, and so I want to address that, and that was one of the things we heard from the site. The center amphitheater area, uh, part of it is covered, uh, but part of it is really wide open, and there's no place for the kids to, to get in there and actually be protected when they're in that environment. And so having a, an assembly out there in the middle of September when it's 115 degrees doesn't work very well. And the, some of the pictures that you see here just kind of examples of what that could look like. Uh, Palm Desert High School. And so here is where I talked about is if we have the need as we move forward in terms of enrollment and enrollment growth, which we see out there at Palm Desert High School, is possibly the need for a new classroom building. Um, we also heard about shade at this site. We heard about uh, additional improvements at the pool. And we did you know, do uh, some major rework at the swimming pool, um, but we still kept an, an older pool. And so some of the equipment there is probably in need of replacement. Uh, we looked at the stadium bleachers on the home side and, and fixing those and addressing those needs. Uh, and then there were some of the career tech issues in terms of the, or, or opportunities to enhance those programs. I shouldn't say issues because they're doing a, a fantastic job out there, but ability to enhance the medical program, enhance the dance and theater program, and make the facilities much more usable in terms of the storage and the things that they need to have a first class program and the development of that. And then last, I think it's the last one, Indio High School. And I showed the picture, this is actually in the right-hand side from the interior of that lunch court. And you have all these tables splayed out around the, the center area, but the kids are just out there kind of baking in the sun. And so the idea of, and you see in the, the master plan, is bringing shade in those areas and creating areas for them so that if they're out there, they're in that center courtyard that they have multiple areas that they can go to, they can spread out, but they can also be protected from, from the sun. One of the other big things at Indio that we weren't able to do when we did the original reconstruction is the stadium. Uh, and so there's some significant ADA issues and things at that stadium. It is a very old stadium. 
uh, needs to be replaced uh, almost in its entirety. Uh, the eSports lab, um, developing that program at that site, they probably, I think they have one now, um, but it's really not set up on a kind of as a state-of-the-art com competitive uh, eSports lab. And we're actually doing one of these out in Rialto right now, and really a terrific program and how they got that set up. Uh, a lot of fun doing those. Uh, the greenhouse that I mentioned before, and we're doing that uh, right now, that project is underway. And then you see shade kind of distributed throughout the campus. Patrick. So next steps as we uh, move forward with the master plan is we're going to complete all the site master plans, as you've seen some of the samples here today. Uh, then we're going to complete all the cost estimates that go along with each campus. Then we're going to prepare some, finan from some financial plan strategies. Uh, complete a prioritization list and recommendation to the board, and then follow up in March or April with a study session and get a little bit more deeper and interact with the board a little bit uh, further. So at this time, we want to just say thank you and turn it over to Mr. Aquino. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, team. Uh, so as you know, the last facilities master plan had about a billion dollars worth of needs. Uh, so ultimately, the plan itself is a roadmap that will help guide us on what we want to address. As Patrick mentioned, we will provide cost estimates to the plan. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's going to be a um, conversation as to how we will ultimately address some of those needs. And we'll be doing that in our next facility study session. So it won't be during a regular board meeting, but in a study session with the board uh, come March, April. Comments, Mr. Alvarez? I have a couple. Um, so I did notice the, what the pictures are really lacking and it just may be the pictures, but um, are you guys using like native plant species, low water use? I would assume so. And that would be just something automatic that you guys would do. And then um, utilizing trees for shade, uh, not just for like open spaces like Indio, I could see where, you know, that's, I don't, they look like metal benches to me and baking in the sun, probably a good 150, 160 degrees. But one thing that we've been learning here in the desert is uh, placing shade trees in the optimal location. So you may have a, a teacher who's baking in one of her classes because it's on the on the corner and it's, you know, south, you know, southeast, southwest, and it's getting cooked all day. Meanwhile, the classes on the backside aren't really getting it, but strategically putting those trees down um, that would reduce uh, actually energy costs into those facilities uh, in the long run. Um, and then also the trees also break up that, that built look of, of concrete and hard edges and stuff like that. Um, the, I do want to um, support an uh, agency out here who's done some work, which is CVAG. Um, they've done something on urban greening recently uh, where they're looking at at plants and plant pallets that could be utilized here in the desert that will help um, support our pollinators um, and utilizing those type of plants that may be beneficial too uh, as our kids are growing up and going through the school district that they learn about some of our native species here um, and how there it's detrimental uh, not only to you know you're talking about heat that we're looking to have that's going to increase over time you know plus minus anywhere from three to five degrees, um, and which makes a huge difference towards the end of the school year, beginning of the school year. Um, but those are things that you know I look at, um, and especially like one of the board members had mentioned, um, protecting our little ones. Our little ones are very apt to overheat fairly quickly. Uh, and for some of us that know that once you get overheated like that, it's easier to become overheated over time. Um, so my concern obviously is, is you know, how well that functions for our kids, um, that they can find, you know, some shaded space, um, but that it's not just, you know, hey, we put some plants out and it looks decorative, but actually, you know, decorate with a purpose. Um, let's see. Yep, that would do. Thank you. Hey, Ms. Pierce. Yes, I'm happy to see that, um, we're looking into enclosing those open spaces. As you said, a big concern of parents and teachers is, is uh, from April to June and August to, I mean, people don't want us to start school earlier and earlier all the time, but 
The truth is August, September are all killer months into October. And why in the desert we never built enclosed gymnasiums is, you know, a, a thought that I'm glad we're looking to the future to enclose those with air conditioning and with the size range, because so many of the multi-purpose rooms that have been used in the past on these hot days don't allow for a PE teacher in elementary that has to cover two complete classes for 60 kids to spread out effectively and do some activities, you know. And the same, the facilities aren't there for the middle school as I saw you were in, think, in closing uh, Colonel Mitchell Page, those ideas. Those are the number one topic in my book is the shade inside for the kids to get for their health and wellness, to get physical education and the thing is, when they come in as your teacher and they're so overheated from PE, maybe because it wasn't a 104 degree day and we didn't stop outdoor activities, they still come in so overheated that you lose about 20 minutes of educational minutes because you have to allow those kids to cool down, decompress, drink water. And it's something that, you know, you can read aloud and do those kinds of things. But I mean, it's just a lot it's a lot on their bodies. So I am so happy to see that these things are gonna be done and I think they're just vital. I was, uh, you talk about the facility at the Eisenhower Community Center. Um, I was uh, happy to go with trustee um, Conover and Porus to see the tiny home. I wish they could build hundreds a year for the homeless community and solve this problem in our valley. I think it's a wonderful thing. I understand somebody in Texas bought it and it's movable. They just drive it off. But um, just the skills and talking to those students was so um, inspiring to see how interested they are and what they're learning and to get the Carpenters Union is involved in there and the partnership with COD. So I just love that that facility is there. And the eSports, I have heard of it because of my grandson, but to see these facilities, and this is something of the future of, you know, competing and, and things, I think that that would really grab a certain uh, section of the kids that are interested in that. So I think this plan, I just love looking at all the projections, and I hope we can put the money together in the future to do this. But thank you for a very good report, and Patrick, too. Thank you. Press. Thank you for that. I I love all of these drawings. It's so amazing what you guys do. It's anyway, but I love the uh, fact that you are at, at just to reiterate around the shade structures, especially um, for our kids, is because it does. It's so hot here. I was born and raised here, and it's people say to me, "Oh, well, you were you lived here your whole life. Don't you get used to the heat?" No, you don't. You don't get used to the heat. So um, anyway, I'm I'm really happy to see that. It seems like they look so tiny. You know, it seems like, is that really going to cover very many kids? Because it just looks so tiny. But um, the other thing I'm really excited about is the um, stadium for Indio High School, because that school is so amazing. I graduated from Indio High School, and it is completely different from when I went there. But the one thing that has always been on my heart is that I feel like it's not complete. I feel like that stadium is just it's an eyesore, it's a dinosaur, it's horrible. And the press box is the main the main thing in that. So I'm noticing in here that the stadium is gonna be there for new bleachers, but is there also gonna be a new press box then? That would be part of the plan. Actually, that existing press box is in the right of way of the street and is actually okay. yeah, a problem for you. Okay, I just didn't see it, so that's why I'm asking. Yeah, again, at the master planning level, we wouldn't get down into that level of detail, but certainly okay. it would be, yes. All right, well, Absolutely. great job, you guys. Thank you so much. Jonathan? Yes, um, thank you so much for your report. Um, you know, I, I, I'm going to go back on, you know, I'm hearing amphitheaters, and back in the day when we went to approve our um, the uh, facilities plan in 2014, um, we approved a $225 million budget, but initially, if I'm correct, it was more like 400 million that everybody wanted. Correct. And we took a red pencil. Yes, you did. Actually, it was Gary Tomac and myself, <laughs> and we said, this is not fair to our homeowners. 
because this is going to radically affect their taxes. And I'm concerned because we've got inflation going on. Um, I, I, I think we've got to be very careful. And as a former school teacher, maybe things have changed in 10 years. But I was at two schools that had an amphitheater, and we didn't use it. Um, because it's really not usable. Even if you have a shade structure, it's it's hot. It's really, okay. really hot for those those little ones. So I, I would caution my colleagues and and you that there's some things I don't want to be frivolous because we are going to be asking, um, you know, for a bond and how much this will cost. So I think that we need to be very careful about that. Um, I also love the idea about shade structures. I agree totally. I love zero scaping. I think that that's extremely important. Um, and even maybe even looking at uh, a turf, you know, not grass, but artificial turf for our uh, stadiums. It might be the better way to go. They've changed what artificial turf was even two years ago is different now. So we might want to consider that. Um, and, you know, finally, I uh, saw you're doing some of the, talked about trying to make it the egress and ingress easier because, mm -hmm. And, um, and I know you guys are architects, you're great. Um, I would like to suggest that when we finally get to that point that we talk to our cities. <laughs> we don't talk to our cities and the cities then go, why did you do that? We could have suggested something better. They have a planning department. So I would really, really, I mean, that. no offense, but that's what's gotten that's the problem with Carter Elementary, and I can name all the other schools where we decided we didn't need to talk to anybody. We were going to do it on our own, and we know better than the cities, except the cities are the ones with the streets all around our schools. So maybe they know something too. So I would caution and I would suggest really to engage them as well as working with them. You don't need them approval. I understand we're an entity to ourselves. We aren't accountable to them, but out of respect, since we're going to be putting, we're doing these modernizations or whatever in those schools, let's have a dialogue. Okay. We've talked about transparency. Let's yeah. do transparency within the cities as well. So that's important. One point of clarification just before you move on, though, we're not proposing any new amphitheaters or anything. All it was was really providing shade if you had something that's out true. there existing. Yeah, no amphitheaters. Yeah, no, <laughs> we no. said no. No, never. No, no. Thank you for the presentation. I do look forward to the study session so we can start prioritizing where we're going to start and where we're going to see how far our money stretches since things have gone up in price drastically. Mm -hmm in the last two years, so it might not go as far as we think. Superintendent Bailey, any comments? For the uh, long partnership, very successful partnership. Appreciate our ability to partner in the audience as well. Uh, thank you, Patrick, and to your team. Thank you. And moving on, the next item, 14 public hearing. We have none. 15 COVID-19 response update, Superintendent Bailey. Thank you. All right, I think probably the big news is that unfortunately there was lack of news in yesterday's press conference. We were anticipating some movement on some of the restrictions regarding COVID protocols, more specifically to student mask guidelines. Unfortunately, that news didn't come, but what did come was um, a notion that February 28th, the CDPH will be addressing that item. So we're looking forward to that guidance, uh, possibly uh, some relaxed student mask guidance uh, would come with that February 28th, so that's the next step. The actual press conference from yesterday is posted on Super Seconds along with some notes, some highlights from what we did here from CDPH. With that said, I'm going to now defer to my right, Dr. Kelly A. Vollmer. Thank you very much. Just a quick update as we continue to consider concerns regarding students who may be behind as a result of COVID, we are planning a robust summer school. Uh, again, this summer, we'll be having all of our high schools focus primarily on credit recovery. They will have some other programs, but that'll be the primary focus. And we'll again this year host those summer schools at each of our high school sites, which is something we've not done in the past with the exception of last year. 
uh, but knowing that the need will be great, we will have those hosted at each of our school sites. And then our middle schools and our elementary schools will be looking at the iReady data um, as it relates to um, English language arts and math and prioritizing those students that are performing below grade level and inviting them to summer school programs. So our elementaries and middle schools hosting programs again as well. And we'll continue to provide updates as more plans get in place. Dr. Kino, business services, any updates? Okay, Dr. Hyde, personnel services. No updates. All right, we'll end with Laura Fisher, student support services. All right, thank you, Mr. Bailey. Um, our district dashboard continues to move in the right direction um, in a downward trend. This evening, we're currently at a total of 135 positive cases, um, 109 students and 26 staff. Compared to where we were last month in the thousands, it is a wonderful trend to see. Um, as you know, the current mask mandate for California expires at midnight tonight. Um, however, the mask... <laughs> I'll take a glance. The, however, the mask requirement for schools remains in place, but the anticipated, as Mr. Bailey was saying, announcement from CDPH on February 28th regarding hopefully some modifications um, to the indoor mask guidance. So as we know, CDPH mask rules remain in place and are legal requirements. The district doesn't have a choice or any discretion on not to follow guidance, whether it is what's now or in any current guidance only how it's implemented, like how you provide masks and how you do different things. We don't have a choice in actually implementing it. Students must wear masks indoors at schools, students and staff, and wearing a mask outdoors, as always, continues to be optional for both students and staff. On to testing in collaboration with Desert Healthcare District and Foundation tests provided and the tests provided by California Department of Public Health. Um, between January 21st and February 9th, we administered 361 rapid antigen tests, 343 PCR tests, and students and staff reported results of 146 home tests. So those numbers, as the numbers go down to positive cases, the testing has obviously decreased a bit. But we all continue to offer the clinics 3.30 to 5.30 every night with PCR and rapid antigen tests. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our remarks. Thank you. Moving on to 16 public comment on open session items. Communications from the floor. In accordance with bylaws of the board 9323, time is reserved for oral communications by members of the Board of Education or by citizens present. Citizens wishing to be heard on agenda items shall have a three minute limit and should indicate their intention at this time. In accordance with the law, decisions of the board cannot be made on any matter not previously published before the board meeting as indicated in bylaws of the board 9323.2. We will start with the online comments. Ms. Jonathan? Yes. Um, first one is Rochelle Martinez. Where do I even start? Two years into the pandemic, two years you sit on your comfortable seats and pretend you're so concerned it's all lies. The only thing you care about is your paycheck. All of you are no different. Uh, than our narcissistic lying governor who doesn't keep to his own rules. You should all be ashamed of yourself and take note of this child abuse. So my child can go to the grocery store, the mall, an indoor large event with no mask, but he can't sit in a classroom of 22 of his fellow classmates who have a better functioning working Im immune system than all the, of you elders on the board. The only thing the children of DSUSD are at risk of is the abuse you continue to display. Five states, yes, five are left masking children. All liberal, deep democratic states continue to take payouts to pretend this isn't political. It can stop with you, but will it? Doubtful because you prefer to pretend you're so concerned when the science, uh, when the science you hide behind already proves masks do nothing. You will continue to make money off our children so you can bask and the sun of your vacation with no guilt. As temperatures rise in our beautiful Coachella Valley, I hope you feel comfortable knowing our children are suffocating with a diaper cloth over their mouths. Yes, a cloth, it's not a life-saving device. No doubt you will all walk around, I, I think they mean maskless, but they said maskless, um, because you know darn well this is a joke and you refuse to sweat in the mouth of a diaper 
but you will continue to abuse your powers to force our children who one day will be paying your Medicare. The second one is from Ashton Davis. It was clear from the beginning and is now stated as fact that masks do, not, do nothing to protect anyone from the spread of COVID. As children are the least at risk of contracting and spreading COVID, I am calling for the immediate removal of all mask requirements on students. The only case study ever done on children wearing masks was canceled due to the cruel nature of forcing children to cover their face. Too much harm has already been done in demoralizing and conditioning children to cover their face. Our children's learning has been hindered long enough. If there are students and teachers who still want to wear a mask, that is their choice to make, but not a choice that should be extended to both sides of this argument. The choice to wear a mask is no different than the choice to take a COVID vaccine. It is clear now that the COVID vaccines do not stop one from contracting or transmitting COVID. We all know the efficacy is so poor for the COVID vaccines. These should also be given to at the discretion of the parent and not required to attend a public school. A student, no matter their age, should be able to, do att to attend school without a mask and without a COVID vaccine. The next one, Anna Essig. Please mask choice. Let our children breathe, smile, and learn the best way possible. Enough is enough. We are done. Take masks off my kid's face. Thank you. The next one is Stuart. No, I don't know if that's first or last name, just Stuart. We are no longer participating in your circus of masking our children. The jig is up. We're standing up for our freedom. And that concludes his um, or hers uh, letter. The next one is Robin Davis. It's quite obvious we are no longer in a state of emergency. I'm sure many of the members of DSUSD board got together with groups of people over the last few weeks, unaware of their vaccine status, as it should be, and without donning a mask. And today our children are being told to wear a mask. You don't need to be told the signs you already know. Masks do not protect anyone from the spread, nor does it slow the process. Furthermore, vaccine for COVID will be encouraged. For what? It doesn't protect anyone from contracting COVID and certainly doesn't protect our children from death with an already 99.9% .9 survival rate. The population that's going to be vaccinated already are. Stop allowing our government to experiment on our children. The next letter, Brooke Walthers. The mask mandate on children in schools needs to end. We are no longer in a state of emergency. Children are instructed to stay home if exhibiting symptoms or if they have been in contact with anyone that has COVID. The fact that the governors, politicians, sub celebrities, and athletes are gathering in larger groups than a classroom setting unmasked is proof in itself that our children um, are safe to do so as well, along with the given science data retrieved in regards to children's COVID cases, unmask our children. The next letter, Rachel Mueller. And mandatory ma face covering now. In addition to causing emotional harm and educationally stunting our children, multiple studies have proven face masks to be ineffective in pr preventing the spread of virus such as SARS, COVID-19. The science is clear. Further, children are not now, nor have they ever been, high-risk carriers of the virus. Finally, the seasonal flu and H1N1 were far more deadly to children than COVID-19. And these mask mandates were never employed as a safety measure for either, so it is clearly not about the children. These mask mandates are pure political theater and elitist power grab, and the mask mandates now. <clears throat> Jeff Gerarsi, as a scientist who extensively trained in the use of PPE, I am well aware that ma face masks being used by Desert Sand students do not prevent illness or disease. I recently contacted face mask manufacturers and asked them to provide a written declaration that their face mask would protect my child from illness or disease. Eight of those companies had inserts contained in the packaging stating that their masks will not stop illness or disease, while two of the companies had the same statement posted on their website. 
One company never even responded to my inquiry. By law, the manufacturer is required to disclose the limitations of their masks they sell, and they do. The limitations described by the mask manufacturers declare that these masks do not protect against illness or disease. As such, DSUSD needs to stop this charade, apologize to all parents and students, and cease this embarrassing mask mandate immediately. The next one, Rachel Griffith. It's time that our children are unmasked. Their social and emotionally maturity, as well as their academics are falling behind due to the inability to see faces. They cannot read facial expressions. They can't hear in order to learn proper speech patterns. We're doing our kids a disservice. While other countries and states are mask free, our children are being forced to comply with a mandate that's not only un-American, but harmful to their well-being. It's time we put our children first, not the political agendas of the corrupt politicians. The next one, Sandra Fernandez. Dear board members, I'd like to say that what our CSEA negotiation team is requesting is for our salary and a one-time incentive is more than fair. Other districts are giving their classified members $2,500 as a one-time incentive and higher pay raise. The only raise we usually get is to help for the raise of health and benefits but other than that, we don't really ever see an extra cent to say we really got a raise to help with our daily expenses. Inflation is eating us up and nobody seems to care. You all need to remember that it has been the classified, as always, that has helped the students, parents, and staff run, bus run businesses during this pandemic. And I truly feel that we are always being treated unfairly and below other higher titled administrators. I think all classified deserves a pay raise for being at work to help serve all of our students. I came to work and took COVID home. And due to that, I infected my mother and she died, leaving me with my 50 year old cerebral palsy disabled sister. And here I am still coming to work, risking getting other family members sick, including my sister, social security, uh, gave the recipients a 5.8% COLA raise and our district wants to give us less than that. What kind of appreciation are we getting for coming to work and risking the lives of our family? At what cost are we risking every day getting sick and killing one of our family members? You all think about it and ask yourself, is this fair? Thank you for your time and I hope you reflect on what you want to offer us as a classified working members dedicated to our students. Good evening board and cabinet members. I'm writing today as a 10 year plus employee and a site representative of our CSEA union for the DEC. I'd like to thank you for the continued support as we navigate through these uncertain times that being said, the thank you letters only go so far. And I would like to ask that you put your money where your mouth is. As the heartbeat of the district, our employees continue to put ourselves in the front line to ensure our schools are able to operate. As an electrician over the past decade, I've put my life on the line every single day. I have even been unfortunate to experience the death of a coworker due to an industrial accident in the field. While you may sit behind the desk in your comfort of your offices, please remember you would not have those comforts if it were not for your maintenance workers continually doing their job. Even during the pandemic and shutdown, we have not skipped a beat. Not only are we here, are we putting our lives in danger, but we're constantly being overworked and underpaid. And I ask you again to please compensate us for the risks we take on a daily basis. Thank you. <laughs> the next letter, Catherine Corson. Good evening, board and cabinet members. I'd like to thank you for your continued efforts in regards to keeping our students and staff members safe through the course of this pandemic. Although there have been changes almost on, a, on the daily in regards to mass mandates, vaccines, and 
testing. I think you have done as best you can with what we've been faced with. While some may not believe the mask mandate work, I have had less sickness come through our home with three school aged children this year than ever, than ever over the past seven years. This tells me the masks are working along with the emphasis on hand washing. While I understand there are several members of our community who don't agree with these precautionary measures, I think it is safe to say they have made a positive difference. Although there have been spikes with Omicron variant, it is a relief to hear the numbers are declining and I hope they will continue to do so. And in the meantime, regardless of the state mandate, I hope you continue to require masks to be worn in the classroom. Additionally, I'd like to uh, again, put emphasis on the sh staff shortages. Our employees continue to be overworked and underpaid. You should be reminded that competitive pay rates play a big role in these shortages. Please show your employers that employees their value by means of pay raises for your classified staff. The negotiations are open and I ask you remain in good standing with your employees by showing them their value by increasing their paycheck. The tradesmen continue to put their life on the line, not only in a pandemic, but by operating with deadly electricity as well. <clears throat> I stated last time, please don't forget that they keep your lights on, your toilets flushing, excuse me. <coughs> lots, of <clears throat> lots of reading. As I stated last time, please don't forget they keep your lights on, your toilets flushing, your technology running, and they continue to be the heartbeat of our district. Thank you for your time and consideration. <clears throat> the next letter, Susan Wadley. I'm Susan Wadley, and over the past six months, I've urged you to have the best interests of our community's children at heart by acknowledging the harm done by masks. COVID shots and a racist or sexually perverse curriculum. Today is the last day of California's illegal indoor mask mandate. So I'm asking you, why are you not dropping the mask mandate in schools? The CDC has admitted that cloth masks have never been effective. For over two years, the CDC has been forcing both children and adults to cover their faces to participate in an altered version of society. The CDC's announcement comes shortly after CNN's Dr. Lena Wen admitted that cloth masks are not appropriate for this pandemic. So over 22 months, the public has been walking around with a useless piece of fabric covering their faces to blind, blindly comply with a completely useless mandate. A speech pathologist in Maryland wrote, the speech issues I see with three and four year olds that have been masked, I've never seen before in 22 years. So much low muscle tone, drooling, unusual articulation, errors on early development sounds. The pores in these masks are at least a thousand times larger in diameter than the diameter of the virus particles. It is a well-established fact and most students are reusing their masks repeatedly. Many store them in their pockets and even on the table while they're eating. This cannot be sanitary or healthy. And there's a great risk for microbial pathogen infections from constantly reusing masks. Some studies have found wide ranging negative psychological impacts on forced mask usage, especially among children, which include chronic stress, fear, anxiety, and activation of the fight or flight response. Masks are also causing skin conditions from micro, microplastics most masks contain. So I ask again, why are you requiring masks in schools? It's clearly a child abuse at this stage as there is zero benefit and masks do cause harm. If you have the authority to end the mandate, please do. And that concludes the ones that were submitted. in-person communications. First will be Nicholas Rose. All righty. 
Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board, members of cabinet. Um, I want to thank a lot of our classified bargaining unit members who are here tonight. We kind of met over at DEC North to talk about negotiations, the status of the contract. So I know it's cold and windy out there, but it was nice to see everybody. We got about 200 folks coming out in support. So a lot of the cheering, a lot of the signs out there. It's our fellow classified bargaining unit members. We are in a unique place at the table that we have a full open contract, which means that we get to do, in my personal opinion, some of the fun things that unions get to do, including take things potentially all the way to a strike vote. So when you th see things around the country, like at John Deere, at Kellogg's, at Nabisco, where workers went on strike, when you see things at Amazon and Starbucks, where people are looking to unionize and get together, when we think about these things of the great resignation and just the premium that there is on labor, that's where, as a bargaining unit, we're really coming from, that we are the nutrition services folks, we are the bus drivers, we are custodians, grounds, security, purchasing department, office support staff, accounting. We are the unsung heroes, right? We are the folks who are here every single day, putting in that time, putting in that effort. Our nutrition services staff won awards from the city of Indio for being here over the summer in the heat in person. Our paraeducators were some of the first to come back to schools. They came back in November of 2020 ahead of all kinds of other staff to service our students who had the most needs. And so that's why as our chapter 106 CSEA president, I am so proud to stand here and advocate for our 1300 members and a couple hundred who are here tonight because these are the hardworking folks of our community that we live here, we vote here, our students go to school here, our grandchildren go to school here. So supporting classified supports our Desert Sands community. So again, when it comes to some of the emails that have been sent, folks that have put their lives on the line, folks that have lost family members for coming to work every day, folks that have been asked to do more and more and more every day with less. Our admin assistants, our office staff, there's just extra stuff of talking about COVID rules, safety rules, doing all this follow-up, and to still have an open contract, to still not be making any progress is just kind of mind-boggling. That when we're talking about the LCAP and $547 million, $473 million in expenses, a $73 million surplus, let's show some appreciation beyond just empty words. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Jamie Tarasco. Good evening, board and cabinet. My name is Jamie Tarasco uh, with CSEA. Uh, I'd like to talk about three different key points tonight, uh, all revolving around the same thing, our classified employees. Uh, hiring and transfers and promotions. Uh, we had a good conversation, I think, with uh, Desert Sands uh, Assistant Superintendent, Dr. Hyde, and also the director, uh, Chad Woods. Um, although we still feel as though uh, transfer opportunities should be uh, offered to our classified members uh, first before uh, giving that, excuse me, before going ahead and allowing uh, outside promotions or transfers to take place uh, using the eligibility list. Uh, we would also like to go ahead and uh, go ahead and look at the, uh, excuse me, the lots of working on the class. Uh, we have our peer eds uh, filling in for teachers, uh, teaching classes, uh, because the teacher that was on prep that sent to the class to cover is now overloaded with classwork and is going ahead and using that prep time to go ahead and just uh, work on their classroom. I have our security agents working through their lunches to cover alarm calls while protecting the students and staff and property of our district. Uh, we also have office staff filling in for other office staff members due to staff shortage and not getting any uh, extra support from them. Many without asking for compensation. For those that do submit compensation, 
uh, such as working on a class or over time. We're seeing within our uh, classified bargaining unit, those classified members having difficulties getting paid uh, for those. Uh, the employees are going several months uh, until they get help with, uh, from CSEA to go ahead and get paid for their out-of-class work. Uh, you guys talked about a master plan and modernizing. Uh, we talked about, I heard, uh, I think it was uh, Ms. Jonathan that mentioned uh, shade structures. Uh, you got to remember, classifieds out there every single day without those shade structures. Um, you know, the, we're the custodians, uh, the groundskeepers, security, uh, pair eds walking the students back and forth to the bus. You got the bus drivers sitting on those buses without them running, uh, without AC. Um, so we talk about the modernization, but uh, you also talk about maintaining these facilities. Who's going to maintain these facilities? The classified is going to maintain them. It's not going to be the certificate in maintaining these facilities. So we need to remember that. Um, and then last, uh, who's going to be seeing these students as they walk in to the campuses or even before they walk into the campuses? You got bus drivers picking them up. These are the students that you guys rely on to come to school every day and learn and get an education. You guys also need to be relying on your classified employees to go ahead and, and, and thank them for the services that they provided to you guys over the last two years now. So thank you. Thank you. Next is Dale Wiseman. I'm, I'm, I'm very stiff because I've been sitting down too long. I've been a labor rep here for 17 years. I'm a proud Desert Sands parent. Been in the field of education for 29 years, and this is an extraordinary district. I've said that. And what makes it extraordinary is that every once in a while we come to a crisis, and that crisis resets uh, labor management relations. We find a way forward, and the district gets better. We did that with elimination of a merit system. We did that after 450 people were out on the streets to settle a two-year contract in 2005, six, seven. We're at one of those points again. You have to settle this contract. The district's proposal is unacceptable. We won't sign it. We will not settle this contract under the current district's proposal and it will go to impasse and fact-finding and, and, and ultimately potentially a strike vote. Even if we were to get together on the money, which is, we're close, the hiring practices in this district are unacceptable. Unacceptable. There are people sitting here who have been denied promotions and transfers because the contract language isn't being followed, that favorites, people related who are getting hired, it should not be who you know, it should be what you know and what your commitment to Desert Sands is. And that's not being honored at all by this administration, at all. And it will create conflict until which time the hiring practices are changed. We have a common sense proposal that does that, that has strong conflict of interest language that is based on your board policy, directly references it. I think we're gonna get there on that one. We have a proposal that allows CSA to be in the room during interviews, that we get a chance to appoint somebody in that process. Ironically enough, we actually have been on most of the interview panels for superintendent, but we can't be on the interview panels for our own people. That makes no sense. We need that because interviews have been conducted by single supervisors who have often hired friends or family members. That's corruption. In fact, there's been two board members, sitting board members, who have inserted themselves into personnel processes. You can't do that. It looks bad, and I get it. We all know people in town, and I've been around a bunch of years and so on, but you cannot be involved in these personnel practices. It looks horrible. We will not settle a contract in, until hiring practices are settled, until the money gets met and you recognize the fact that classified employees showed up to work, got through a pandemic, and were often the only ones there while administrators and teachers were home. So they're very upset about that. They want to be recognized for the, and, and honored for that, and they want a fair transfer and promotion process to be able to move up through the district. You, we don't get that. You don't get labor peace. That's the bargain. Please honor these people with the contract. Thank you. Yes. 
Felipa Manríquez. Good evening, cabinet and board members. I am an administrative assistant at one of our school sites here within Desert Sands. I'm speaking on behalf of the clerical staff from all schools. Holding a classified clerical staff position comes with great responsibilities. We are the channels of communication to our schools, district departments, parents, and our community. We ensure our schools in Desert Sands are running smoothly. Additional duties were assigned to us when we opened up again after the state shutdown of schools and businesses. We open our doors once again to our students in 2020, 2021, and more duties are being added based on the continuous changes of the COVID mandates. Never have we been offered any type of compensation. Now, we're not just being exposed to minor contagious illnesses like the common cold, the flu. We're daily being exposed to several deadly viruses, including the coronavirus, that has killed close to 6 million people and the numbers continue rising. This information needs to be updated in our job descriptions for sure. Now let's fast forward and see what the additional duties are with the COVID in the air as we open our schools with a safety plan in place. We are, the follow we are following the COVID mandates in place, oversee and distribute and collect COVID weekly testing for our, back our unvaccinated staff. The need stop what we're working on, whether it's assisting teachers, dealing with unfilled assignments, calling subs to see if they're willing to lend us a helping hand, reaching out to the personnel department to see if they can help us out, or frequently calling our custodians to disinfect the areas and rooms to ensure the safety of our staff and students. We also have gone above and beyond providing the additional documentation required to report COVID exposures and COVID cases to the appropriate departments. The additional health techs hired from outside agencies and assigned to each of the school sites have not been consistent in providing the support promised. Schools have gone weeks without a health tech. The lack of health techs have created a tremendous burden and additional work for the clerical staff in the office. We have been designated when the need arises, in quotes, health techs, to attend to students with visible COVID symptoms. We have been instructed to reach out to the hit nurse, but no additional help arrives, leading us to do what we do best, step up to the plate and deal with it and do our very best to make it through the day. The so-called isolation room that has that was supposed to be in an isolated area has now been shifted numerous times to the front office meaning exposing everyone in the office and not to mention dealing with the angry parents who demand to keep their students in school. We, the clerical staff, have done more than what has been asked of us to do, but the stress to meet our deadlines effectively with the additional duties assigned to each one of us have not been taken into consideration. Thank you. The message you're sending to the classified employees who have been working behind the scenes since the beginning of the pandemic is we don't matter. Thank you. But yet Your you time state is up. are the backbones to the district. But remember, we're all on the same team here. And what's good for one is good for everyone. Ms. Manriquez, your time is up, Ms. Respect, Manriquez. But okay, not next. just with work, but with action. Next is Ursula Leguelo. Good evening, cabinet and board members. I want you to look around the room. This is not half of us. There are some in the NPR and there are some of us outside. So I want you to listen closely of what we're going to say. I stand before you as CSEA Chapter 106 Chief Union Steward. My job is to hear concerns from classified members with any job related issues. The past year has been challenging for us all but we can all agree that classified employees have been in the trenches since the beginning of the pandemic and are still currently performing our jobs. We go, above, we go beyond when asked to perform our duties and those outside our job description without any hesitation. Here are some examples of what I'm speaking about. One, paraeducators take control and run the classroom when no guest teacher is available. Yeah. Two, Administrative assistants collect spit vials for COVID testing. 
three 69 pair educators change diapers, which is not in our classification. Four, office staff are asked to be bilingual. We are asking for the same respect when many others in the district get. For example, teachers get paid for skipping their prep time. District employees get extra hours and are paid for additional job duties. Classified employees are expected to, to go with the flow and be a team player, and we've been doing just that, and we're happy to help. However, when is enough? Where's our compensation for all the additional work we do? Working out of class is in our contract, and it is in the California Education Code. So why is it so hard for the district to pay us 5% more? Especially when site administrators, our principals, are approving the work. But district administrators override that approval and denies the working out of class. Should we just say no to helping our community by being bilingual? Should we say no to changing student diapers? Should we say no to supporting students in our class when no teacher is available? We say yes to all of this and more. We are asking the district to say yes to compensate classified employees. Ms. Jonathan, you stated that the board is a check and balances of Mr. Bailey. So who's the check and balances of the district administration when they disapprove working out of class for classified employees? Thank you. Thank you. Next is Elena Nishi. Good evening. I'm here to address the enforcement of CGPH mass guidance by Desert Sands Unified. On January 18, 2022, I requested that the board provides a policy explaining which medical product, face masks, is appropriate for our children to wear at Desert Sands District Schools. As of today, this request has still not been fulfilled. According to the 21 U.S. Code 360 BBB, Appropriate conditions designed to ensure that individuals to whom the product is administered are informed of the significant known and potential benefits and risks of such use and of the extent to which such benefits and risks are unknown and of the option to accept or refuse administration of the product of the consequences, if any, of refusing administration of the product and of the, of the alternatives to the product that are available and of their benefits and risks. The law is clear. Each of the current experimental medical procedures being illegally administered by school districts and schools in California require informed consent under federal law 21 U.S. Code 360-BBB-3. Performing medical procedures or administering medical products to our children including but not limited to experimental vaccines, experimental masks, or experimental testing without consent is illegal. Further, under California law, a minor cannot consent to their medical care unless they're essentially emancipated pursuant to Family Code 6922. It is also important to inform you that a minor child cannot be entered into a clinical trial without express consent from their parents and even then only if there is a benefit and a minimal risk to the child. As of today, there is no respected study that shows significant benefits of masks the way they are used by kids. Desert Sands Unified School District is clearly in violation of multiple laws. Our children might not be forced to use these experimental medical products. Any person primarily responsible for the conduct of the medical experiment who willfully fails to obtain informed consent is subject to civil liability. In addition, the CDPH guidance is a non-binding recommendation that schools can and should disregard. We, the parents, withdraw our consent to any of these experimental medical procedures and experimental medical products. No more tests and no more masks for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ruth A. Hill. Ruth A. Hill, okay. Good 
Good evening. My name is Ruth Hill. I'm a permanent resident of Palm Desert and I'm an RN. I'd like to share with you the current 14 month bears data for children five to 11 years old. There has been 7,724 7, adverse reactions, including three deaths. All of the adverse reactions are myocarditis and blood clotting. For 12 to 17 year olds, there's 28,793 adverse events with 38 reported deaths. And this is just in the 14 months. All of those are anaphylactic shock, myocarditis and blood clots. Is your career worse if when the district and each of you individually receive a claim from a parent asking for damages for your criminal behavior, your child abuse behavior, or your financial responsibility. Let me explain why your behavior is criminal. On December 6, 2021, the United Kingdom courts have sued Boris Johnson, Bill Gates, and Dr. Fauci in that order in the Nuremberg Court for crimes against humanity for imposing mask and vaccine mandates without informed Ma consent. Ma'am, could you please put your mask on? Crimes against humanity do Thank not you. have a statute of limitation. You think that you are not coming for you? Don't hold your breath. Missouri Supreme Court ruled that all mandates are unconstitutional. So has the U.S. Supreme Court on January 1st declared the vaccine mandates as a condition of work are unconstitutional. The cost of Kone Unified School District has reversed all of its mandates for mask and SARS COVID against the, uh, with a threat of suit by the parents. This reversal makes moot your, your concern that you cannot change anything by, by anybody's edict. It's unconstitutional and you're liable for it. And get ready because we are going to start suing you and we're all learning to do that with your sur surety bond. So the uh, Arizona parents have already done this and they're teaching the rest of the country and other people to do this. The Great Barrington Declaration says that what you're doing is a crime. The recovery rate for children is 99.9%. .9%. So what you are doing is a crime and you will be sued for it. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Martha Long. No, I don't have COVID. <laughs> Good evening, cabinet members, board members. My name is Martha Long. For 29 years, I've worked with nutrition services at Desert Sands Unified. For the last 22 months, my department has worked feverishly in extreme temperatures, feeding the community at curbside. We were out there when it was raining. We were out there when it was windy. We were out there when it was 120 degrees in the parking lots with hardly any shade standing on asphalt for two hours each day. We are considered the essential workers. <clears throat> we worked out there without complaint. We worked closely together. We worked in fear of catching COVID from our customers, but we were the sense of normalcy for them. Each day they picked up their food, we said, hello, we waved at the kids and they said, and they're like, when is this gonna stop? We didn't know. We said, hopefully tomorrow's a better day. As time went on, most of us were worried because we were afraid we would take it home. My group was very lucky. I caught COVID July 4th, not from work, but from a nail salon. I told my staff, I told them I was sorry because I failed them. I became sick with COVID and I was afraid to infect my staff members. District came in, they cleaned my kitchen. I was gone for 10 days. I had a mild case. <clears throat> we were there 
when nobody else was on campus. We were there when custodians were only allowed twice a week to be on campus. We were there when teachers were teaching at home and they were still collecting a paycheck and they had the comforts of home. Us essential workers, we didn't have that comfort. We were right there in the front line. So all I ask of you, board members, cabinet members, is give us a fair contract that we deserve and the respect we deserve with a fair contract. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Brad Anderson. Brad Anderson. Was he there? No? no? Okay. Next is Amanda Hyder. Amanda Hyder. either okay next Keith Lathrop how's it going everyone I uh we've been up here a couple times now I've been to a bunch of these meetings kind of feel bad because I came here to bitch about all the COVID stuff and I just want to let all you guys know man as a parent I appreciate everything that you guys are doing I hope you guys hold out and make sure that these shitbirds pay you because you deserve it so so before I, before I start, I just wanted to say that. I wanted to start tonight by addressing the parents. I wanted to start with an analogy. Um, a man at a circus sees an elephant tied to a post with just a tiny rope. He asked the trainer, how does a small rope contain such a large animal? The trainer said it has nothing to do with the rope. It's all about conditioning. We tied that rope around his neck when he was just a baby. He still thinks he's too small to break through it. I can't help but think that this is an analogy of my generation. Our government has allowed the school system to weaken our thought from a very young age to condition us into believing that their authority is stronger than our will. Sadly, it's worked, and nothing will change until my peers break this cycle of irrational compliance. Luckily, there's a simple solution to all this. All you have to do is stop complying. Stand up for yourself. Stand up for your kids. If you don't want to wear a mask, take it off. Don't back down to the hypocrites who tell you to put it on. We've been conditioned, not castrated. Don't be afraid of confrontation, especially when the truth and passion is on your side. I was at an arcade yesterday with my son. Uh, a manager came up to us and told us to put on a mask. In the past, I probably would have complied, or if my wife was there, we would have just left. But since it was just my son and I, I thought it was important for him to see me take a stand at this crap. I told the manager that we're not leaving until we're done with the coins that we'd purchased, and we're not going to wear a mask. We argued for a few minutes, but he finally conceded after noticing the scene that he was causing. He said we only had to wear a mask if we went to the counter or we can come back in the next two days to turn in our tickets after the mandate is lifted. We both kind of laughed and I could tell he was just as frustrated as I was. It's all just kind of getting ridiculous. Uh, we continued to play with our coins uh, without further incident. The only thing that changed was that everyone around us had taken their mask off. Oppressed people are desperate to see strong-willed individuals challenge authority motivates them to do the same. The more we push back the mandate enforcers, I'm sorry, the more we push back the, the mandate enforcers get, the more, the more it costs them to continue in their actions. Rational people will stop doing something once the cost of doing it outweighs the benefit. For example, the manager at the arcade yesterday only argued with me for a couple minutes until he was just like, oh, forget it. I can argue with this guy all day or I can go back to my job, doing my job and 
make the same amount of money without the headache, which is exactly what he did. So I was going to rag on the board for a little bit, but my time's up. Um, don't look to them for, for answers or solutions to these problems. The COVID regime ends just as soon as we stop complying. So just, you know, stop complying. Don't be afraid of these guys. I'm going to take my mask off in peaceful protest. And I'll sit here and tell someone who represents your authority who has a gun tells me to leave. I'm not trying to cause a scene, but thank you. Hopefully, uh, hopefully in the future, if more people will take a stand with me. Thank you. We'll get through this. Brad Anderson was not here in person, but he did submit a letter. I'll go ahead and read it. This is from Brad Anderson. Dear DSUSD current board members, I was denied access to DSUSD boardroom today, February 15, 2022 at 1.30 p.m. for the special DSUSD board meeting to select a different board member for area two. The action of this tax funded organization to deny the public access to petition unjustified and clearly unprofessional conduct of a lawlessness public agency is morally corrupt and lacks integrity of all willing participants. Opposed to any attempt to fund board members that don't attend board meeting where they are accessible to the public at those events. Opposed to any and all attempts to require DSUSD students and employees to wear face covering masks. Only students or employees that choose to participate in what is clearly an unproven and it says potential, potential mental health condition by wearing devices that impede breathing should enjoy their ability to be different from normal human behaviors while collecting tax funded resources. Sincerely, Brad Anderson. And that is the last of the communications from the floor. Okay, item 17, board and superintendent comments. Uh, Mr. Alvarez, do you have any comments? Uh, I'll just make it real quick. Um, I just appreciate the opportunity to serve on the board. Um, and I also appreciate my, my family supporting me in this endeavor. And I look forward to the remainder of the year. Thank you. Thank you. I'll wait a few minutes. Okay, Ms. Pierce. Ms. Pierce, do you have any comments? I'm gonna wait till it's quiet. Um, yes, um, I'm happy to hear that our summer school program will be very inclusive and expanded to the degree that it's going to, to attempt to help many, many students in their credit recovery or in, in their uh, academic achievement to improve that. Um, also, I wondered, um, I know the iReady data for the middle school and elementary inviting certain students to come, but I wondered if it would all be also, I think last year, maybe it was, it was also open to other students too, just um, for their mental health and engagement. Um, would that be a part two or would it only be limited to if you fit the, data <laughs> yeah it's certainly not our desire to deny any parent or student that wants that opportunity we just want to focus first and foremost on the students that absolutely need that for um, remediation but but yeah that where there's no discussion of denying students the opportunity okay good yeah no problem and also i'm happy as uh mrs fisher reported that the dashboard i've been watching it every day and i just can't believe it was in the 2000s back in january and here we are with, uh, we're very fortunate that our cases have gone down. We have a lot of outreach to help help with that and that the students and teachers are complying doing the hand washing. And I just believe that hopefully uh, this um, these cases will continue to 
to do, do so. I look forward to February 28th to see what our directions are for the schools and masks and to follow along with what is required of us and so that we can do the best for the students and keep them safe. Thank you. Porras. Thank you. Um, I just want to welcome Jacob again to the board. We're happy to have you here. I'm glad to work with you. And uh, Nadia is gone, but I just wanted to welcome her um, to the board um, and supporting Amistad. And I know that Dr. Gustafson was here supporting her and he's just an awesome principal and always supporting his students. And my two, son, two of my sons went to Amistad, so it's an awesome school. And I just want to reiterate again about the tiny houses that we went and saw the tiny houses and it was just so neat to see them. And uh, Kevin Bebo is amazing. And it was really, it was, I, I couldn't believe they actually built that house on top of the, the, the wheels and they can just carry it everywhere. So, um, and like Ms. Pierce said, I'd love to see little tiny houses everywhere so we could help our homeless um, people. Um, and yes, I am looking forward to February 28th and I would love for us to get rid of these masks. It would be so awesome. So we could see our kids' faces and get back to some sort of normalcy. It'd be really great. And I also want to say that um, as far as CSEA, I appreciate everything um, that you guys do. Now everybody's gone, but I just wanted to say that I, I really appreciate the hard work um, that they do. And they do do, they are here every single day, day in and day out. And they haven't gone home during this COVID. And they are just amazing. Um, I have a lot of friends that are classified and I know that they work hard and I know they put a lot of time in. So I just want to say that I really do appreciate them. Thank you. Ms. Jonathan. Yeah, um, I, I also want to say I'm glad to hear about the, um, uh, the summer school that we'll be having both the high school, middle and elementary schools. Obviously we're very concerned about the learning loss that's happened during the past year and a half, two years. Um, I am looking forward to the 28th of February, but I'm a little concerned because when Gally was asked about what criteria there would be uh, that we had to meet uh, on the 28th in order to not have masks, he was very vague and said, there's a lot of factors. So my concern is, I don't think that there is a plan um, for the 28th. Um, I think that we're going to be told continue with masks and I'm all right with that but if only if there's criteria that I'm given I'm given I, we as a board look at data all the time I'm just not hearing data will be the driving force for the 28th so I'm very concerned about that um, and uh, <clears throat> there'll be some things that I'll be wanting to address at the end of the meeting but I do want to say as a person that started off in classified, I understand um, a, the, the role that the classified has in our district. And um, I believe and I hope that it's, my colleagues feel the same, that you are extremely important. You're essential for our district. Um, and so thank you for everything you guys do. Comments? I want to agree with um, my peers who said CSEA are classified are essential. They are essential to everything that happens at this district every day from morning to nighttime. They, you will always find classified there and I'm appreciative of that. Also, um, as far as February 28th, I think we are all looking forward to what the next um, guidance is for us. I know many people have different opinions, so I'm just hoping to see what comes down on February 28th. And we're gonna go on to item 18, general functions, business services. There are three general functions, business service items. Is there a motion to take general functions, education service items 18.1 to 18.3 as a group or individually? A motion to take general functions business services 18.1 to 18.3 as a group. Is there a second? Barbara seconds it. 
It has been moved and seconded to take business service items 18.1 through 18.3 as a group. Any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? This motion carries 5-0. And we're moving on to 19, general functions. We have 19.1, software license agreement with EduPoint Educational Systems, LLC. Is there a motion to approve the software license agreement with EduPoint Education Systems, LLC? Group 19.1 software agreement with EduPoint Educational Systems. Is there a second? Second, Tricia Pierce. It has been moved and seconded to approve the software license agreement with EduPoint Educational Service or Systems, LLC. Any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? This motion carries 5-0. Moving on to item 20. There are two items in general functions, personnel services. Is there a motion to take general functions, personnel services, item 20.1 and 20.2 as a group or individually? So move Linda Porras, take them as a group. Is there a second? Second, Trisha Pierce. It has been moved and seconded to take general functions, personnel services as a group. Any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? This motion carries 5 0. 21, general function, student support services. We have uh, one, 21.1 agreement with, is that Enomi or Enome? Enome? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a motion to approve the agreement with Goldbook Incorporated? So move Linda Porras. Is there a second? Second, Trisha Pierce. It has been moved and seconded to approve the agreement. Any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? This motion carries 5-0. 22, general function, superintendent. There is a resolution, number 22 slash 2021-2022, remuneration of the board. Is there a motion to approve, to adopt resolution number 22 slash 2021 to 2022? Is there a second? Jacob Alvarez. It has been moved and seconded to adopt resolution number 22 slash 2021, 2022. Any discussion? Hearing none, as this is a resolution, it calls for a roll call vote. Mr. Alvarez. Aye. Ms. Pierce. Aye. Ms. Porras. Aye. Ms. Jonathan. <laughs> Aye. No. <laughs> Ms. Porras, I think you need to abstain. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh. Okay, I'll abstain. Sorry. That's what threw me off. I was like, mm, no. And Ms. Jonathan. Aye. And I vote aye. This motion carries four zero and one abstention. Item 23, consent items, student matters. There are none. Item 24. There are 14 items in consent items, business services. Is there a motion to take consent items, business services, item 24.1 through 24.14 as a group or individually? I'm yeah. Jacob Barbara's moves as a group. Is there a second? Second, Trisha Pierce. It has been moved and seconded to take consent items, business services as a group. Any discussion? Yeah, I, I just wanted to talk about the cash donations um, that we had and um, there are a couple that I wanted to point out. We have Rotary of, uh, Club of Indio that um, donated a total of $2,000 uh, to Kennedy, to, a total of $2,000. And the schools that benefited were Kennedy, Alphonse, Roosevelt, and Van Buren. Um, and it's such a great club and so supportive of our schools. And um, you also have Shadow Hills Country, Shadow Sun City Shadow Hills Country Club 
donated $5,504 to um, our Shadow Hills High School for athletics. I mean, I, that, that's a lot of money. Um, so I want to thank them. That's really, really wonderful to see. Any other comments or discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? Motion carries 5 0. 25, item 25. There are four items in consent items, educational services. Is there a motion to take consent items, educational services, item 25.1 through 25.4 as a group or individually? Take 25.1 to 25.4 as a group. Linda Porras. Is there a second? Second, Wendy Jonathan. It has been moved and seconded to take consent items, educational services, 25.1 through 25.4 as a group. Any discussion? I want, th want to thank Bighorn Cares and Ironman Foundation, which I didn't even know donated to things, uh, for their grants to Amistad. Any other comments or discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? This motion carries 5-0. 26, consent items, personnel services, there are none. 27, consent items, student support services, there are three items in consent items, student support services. Is there a motion to take items 27.1 through 27.3 as a group or individually? The motion to take them as a group, Patricia Pierce. Is there a second? Second, Linda Porras. It has been moved and seconded to take consent items, student support services as a group. Any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? This motion carries 5 0. 28 consent items, superintendent. There are none. 29 personal action, personnel action certificated. Dr. Hyde, do you have any items? Yes, we have a blind point uh, item that I'd like to recommend. And that is uh, 29.1 under certificated personnel agenda item number 14 on page two. We are pleased to recommend the appointment of Leslie Wells to the position of assistant principal at Eisenhower Community Education Center. Yeah. 29.1, is there a motion to approve item 29.1, certificated personnel? So move, Linda Porras. Is there a second? second it has been moved and seconded to approve item 29.1, certificated personnel. Is there any discussion? Yes, uh, I'll, we have a few, four people that are retiring. Uh, Diane Marks, who happens to be a very good friend of mine and neighbor, and our kids grew up together. Um, she's at Washington Charter Elementary, and she's retiring after 20 years of service. Margaret McLaren uh, from Palm Desert Charter Middle, she uh, is retiring after 19 years of service. Mary, Mary Alice Owens, she's the principal of Lincoln Elementary. She's retiring after 16 years of service. And Daryl Salazar, oh my goodness, he opened Palm Desert High School um, He was, as the athletic director and he's uh, at Palm Desert High. I don't know what Palm Desert High is going to do without him. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure if his wife, Donna Salazar, does want him to retire. So <laughs> this is a whole different other subject, but he, an incredible impact he's had on the athletic department at Palm Desert High School. And he's retiring after 44 years. And that's a total of 99 years of service from just these four people. So congratulations, enjoy your retirement. Is there any other discussion or comment? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries, 5-0. Item 30, personnel actions classified. Dr. Hyde, do you have any items? Yes, we have another uh, blind appointment announcement, and that's under uh, 30.1 classified personnel, agenda item number 22 on page three. 
We are pleased to recommend the appointment of Juan Alvarez Jr. to the position of Manager of Maintenance Services. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve item 30.1 classified personnel? Oh. <laughs> Second, Linda Porras. Okay, it has been moved and seconded to approve item 30.1 classified personnel. <laughs> Is there any discussion? Yes, we have one person retiring from the classified retirement and it's Maria Lopez. She's retired from uh, Shadow Hills High School. She's a nutritional service uh, assistant and she's retiring after 28 years. Congratulations, Maria. Any other comments or discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries, 5-0. 31, call out of closed session actions. Superintendent Bailey. I have one. This is in reference to closed session item 3.2. In closed session, the board took action to accept the suspension of classified employee number 220728, Campus Security Agent 1, under the terms of a stipulated suspension agreement. This motion carried 5-0 on a motion by Mrs. Poor, seconded by Mrs. Pierce. Thank you. Item 32, suggestions for future agendas that receive at least three votes. Mr. Alvarez, do you have any suggestions? Thank you. Ms. Pierce. Done. Thank you, Ms. Porras. I have none, but I wanted to mention something that I forgot to mention before. So at John Glenn, I went to the farmer's market. They had all the local growers there, and it was pretty amazing to see them. And the kids went through and got bags of fresh produce, and they didn't even know what the names of some of the produce was, which was pretty cool. And anyway, it was my birthday, and Dan Capello and Nutrition Services made a birthday cake for me, and everybody sang happy birthday. It was pretty special, so it was really nice. So anyway, I forgot to mention that, so thank you for indulging me. One more thing, so, but I have nothing to um, talk about for, you know, three votes. Anyway, thank you. Jonathan. Yeah, it's more um, informational. Um, I, somebody, one of the people that got up and spoke mentioned that there were two sitting members, board members that got involved in um, hiring. Um, I found that alarming and I would like to know if you could find out who they are and what they're talking about because I'm, I don't know, if, I know it wasn't me and I'm a little alarmed that we had, someone came up to the dais and said that we had two sitting board members that gotten involved in the hiring practices at this district. And I'm unaware that that's happened. So I'd like to follow up on that and get a report out. Um, and then the other item I wanted to talk about, I, I mentioned paraeducators covering teacher classroom. Well, but paraeducators can't because they're not certificated. They can't be alone with the students. So I just want to again, get clarification of that because legally, I mean, that's illegal. So, um, can you clarify that for me? Okay. Is it true they can cover the classroom for 20 minutes with, while a teacher is out? Or someone mentioned that to me uh, that contacted me about it. That's not correct. Okay. I didn't no, there, there's a provision in, a, in an MOU that we signed that would allow people with bachelor's degrees that are cleared to, to, to substitute, to potentially substitute in a class if there's a position, a classified sub behind their position. We have a handful of those occasions that are well-documented and well-supported um, in our ECE classrooms. So if there are, and if you can just look that into it and, and verify that that's not happening, but again, I find that alarming that someone's saying that there's paraeducators being left alone in the classroom. I'll look into it again. I, I have looked into it um, as early as, or as late as last week, and I did not find an example And those of two board members, whoever you are, <laughs> I'm watching. I know it's not you. <laughs> I have none, so I have no suggestions for that. Okay, item 33, moving on, announcements. The next regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Education will be on Tuesday, March 1st, 2022, at 7 p.m. at the District Education Center Boardroom at 47950 Dune Palms Road, La Quinta, California. 
Item 34, we do not need to reconvene to close session. 35, adjournment. This meeting is adjourned at 9.50. Thank you to deputies, security, appreciate it. Audio, technology.